is one of the best ways that you can support the podcast and your training is to join the crew. When you join the crew, you get an extra crew cast podcast every single month. <laughs> you also get access to our Discord, which has a training Q&A with Team Elite FTS members. You get form checks. You can upload any of your training footage and have your lifts diagnosed, sometimes within minutes by multiple people. Access to close to 30 different eBooks, training logs, and first sign up access to our weekly weekend training retreats, uh, train your ass off, and other events that we do. Biggest takeaways from that though, what people enjoy the most and get the most out of is the training Q&A and the form checks as well as the extra podcast. Hey guys, I'm back in the gym with another limited edition apparel drop. This is the new Live, Learn, Pass On shirt. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about our cambered grip American cable attachment. This attachment has four grips and it's cambered. So when you flip it, it actually becomes eight grips. And if you turn it upside down, there's actually 16. This is one of our most used cable attachments out in the gym. <clears throat> even got that full range of motion we got a second limited edition drop this month as well head over to elitefts.com pick up the shirt pick up the cable attachments and we'll see you next time matt with elite fts here at the armory in columbus ohio this is a new build beautiful facility should be opening up around november 1st 2023 looking at the posterior chain developer signature version it's gonna have the logo panels on there reverse hypers you can do glute ham raises back raise um, any kind of posterior chain movement you want to do on this piece this is really good the best thing about this so you just step down on the release adjust it so it makes it really easy to adjust these no pop pins or anything like those sorts so this is the signature Posterior chain developer by EliteFTS.com. Americ Health is a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. Are you looking to optimize your health in and out of the gym, improve recovery, sex drive, and quality of life? Have you tried speaking to your health professional about this and have gotten the cold shoulder, stereotyped, or just told as part of getting older? You just go to AmericHealth.com backslash table talk and you can create your own lab or you can take labs that we've had set up for them, which are based upon the same labs that I've been doing over the last 15 years. Or you can use their guided optimization. With this, they'll put you in touch with a patient care coordinator, which is actually pretty cool because you get to sit down and speak to somebody that can understand what you're looking for from hormone optimization and the preventative and medicine standpoint. After that conversation, they'll determine which labs that you should and which tests you should have done. And then from there, get the labs done. They'll review those labs with you and put you in touch with one of their hormone optimization specialists that can determine which supplementation that you should use over the counter or prescription. AmericHealth.com backslash table talk. The discount code is table talk. Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate, and we are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives, and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. All right, guys, we're back with another episode of Table Talk. Before I start real quick, I've had in the last week four different people ask me why I don't have discussions about current events, which is kind of a weird thing because it's not a podcast for current events. But the, the pushback that I've got from that is because you have a platform, then you have a voice, so you should be discussing current events and so forth that go with that. So my my pushback to that, since there's been like four people in a week, so probably other people are thinking that, is the way that I see things is most of the discussions I would have with people just in everyday life about things that are current event based, typically in my bubble, typically don't have their priorities very straight. <laughs> so the problem becomes, is their thought process about the current events that they're speaking about even on point? So to reiterate things that I've said in past podcasts many times is you need to, the way that I see all this is you need to take, you have, you have to have your own house in order first, right? 
So mentally, physically, spiritually, are you in check? And are you in a position where you can think cognitively with common sense and not have polluted, brainwashed brains because of all the stimulus that you have or shouldn't have, which is a whole other thing there because it's part of what we're going to talk about today. This kind of bleeds into a lot of things we're going to talk about today is kind of get your own house in order. Then after that, your family should be next. You know, so you take care of your own health, mental health, physical health first, then your family's mental health, physical health, stability and all that. And then for myself, it's my staff that follows there. Anything that's left over after that, which usually isn't a whole lot, then I can devote that time to current events if I so decide to do that, where I think the difference that can be made on a more global level is if everybody just did that first then they mentally would have a better time getting through the world and dealing with everything that's going on in the world because they're not doing that. Then the stressors, which we're going to define throughout this podcast, what that really means are not only inhibiting their ability to see what current events actually are, what's real, what's not real, but it's actually affecting their ability to recover from their training, their ability to run a successful business, the ability to have a successful relationship with spouse, family, and friends as well. So just dial it back and check those boxes first beforehand. So this podcast is to help check those boxes first. And that's the main reason. The second reason is that's not my wheelhouse. There's other places to go for all that kind of shit. Mm -hmm. But again, when you're having conversations and they're with people in regards to things like that, question your own self as you're having this conversation, what kind of shape that they're in, what kind of mental shape that they're in, what kind of stress are they under? What kind of physical stress are they under? Because it actually may not even be what their real thoughts are if their brain was functioning optimally in the way that it should be. So the goal then is for our brains to function optimally as they should be, which is where Dan Garner is going to come in and kind of help with all this. So Dan is the founder of Team Gardner Inc. He's worked with dozens of professional athletes. I, I'm going to list them all here. So the NFL um, NBA, UFC, Olympic athletes, WWE, IFBB, PGA, MLB, and probably more that I didn't even write down in here and been doing this for a long time. You've, <clears throat> you've kind of developed your own training philosophy and performance philosophy. I don't want to say training because that puts it in one wheelhouse right. performance philosophy around using different biomarkers you know, labs to be able to lay out their training, nutrition, supplementation, and so forth. And from that, this philosophy has evolved that's allowed you to maximize the performance in all those athletes, other athletes, as well as entrepreneurs, and so forth. Also a husband and a father, mm -hmm. right? So at the same time, you have to balance all these things yourself. Right. So before we start getting into a lot of these different topics, how did you get to where you are now? Yeah. Um, so getting to where I am right now, man. Um, thank you for the introduction. First of all, thank you for having me here. This place is absolutely incredible, dude. This thank is. A, I wanted to upfront with that. This is a. It's really awesome being here uh, because I started at Gold's Gym. That's really where everything began. I was a base level personal trainer at Gold's Gym. Well, before that, I was actually in a machine shop. I was one of the guys in um, in high school who got terrible grades because I had no idea what I wanted in life. I had no didn't know what direction I wanted to go in, and um, I would regularly get like 60s in class. And if I got like a 70 something, it's like, damn, that, that was a good one. You know, yeah. that regularly happened in high school because I wasn't, I wasn't interested in like in anything that I was being taught in this standard school system. So then after high school, I just kind of took the easy route and I got a trade job. I was already decent with working with my hands. So I worked at a machine shop. Um, and in that time period, I had been there for about three and a half years. And one of the greatest things that ever happened to me in my whole life was the machine shop wasn't doing well. So they laid off about 50% of the employees. And I was a younger guy on the totem pole with respect to seniority. So I got axed. And at that time, it was like a real pivotal changing point where I was like, okay, 
this is my chance to do something that I actually love in my life. I've seen the other side of the door where I kind of just have a nine to five type of job that I don't get emotional fulfillment from. I know what that looks like. And to this day, it motivates me to where I'll never, ever, ever go back to something like that again. I started training when I was 14 years old. And Ever since then, my dad actually brought home from a garage sale um, because I knew I wasn't going to grow any taller. So I was like, okay, I better grow wider than if I'm mm -hmm. going to be a force in any sports <laughs> here. So then uh, he brought home uh, one of those uh, gold plastic uh, concrete filled weight mm -hmm. sets from York. A lot, of the, a lot of people used to have those back in the day. And uh, I've had a relentless curiosity of all things biology and biochemistry ever since then. Um, and it was, it's a type of blessing to not have the genetics to be big and strong because it forced me to learn all the different ways to be big and strong. How can I perform? How can I leverage not what I want, but what I have? So back in the day, it was all about these ancient fossils called forums and magazines. And I'd be reading those every single day and uh, staying on top of everything I could. And then you compound that over time like in the machine shop I'm, I'm there at like 20 years old or something but that's six years of articles every single day like and then passion every day and trial and error in the gym um that whole process and then i ended up actually doing training and nutrition strategies for all the guys in the machine shop so like the, the writing was already on the wall. That's what I was most passionate about. So then when I got laid off from that machine shop, I was like, I am going to die before I ever go back and do something like that again. So then I, I stopped. I took no break at all. I went right to college. Um, and then in college, I actually was tutoring the year above me. I earned something like six certifications on top of the full-time college curriculum because I to this day, I, I couldn't get enough. I, there, there's no satiation point with how many questions I have and how much more I want to learn and how fascinating physiology is. So then I get out of college. Was and, it physiology when you were in college? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Physiology. That's, that's a number one thing that I think um, a coach should get a real firm. I think that's the number one skill set that somebody could have. Um, because a lot of things that I talk about on podcasts that like, yo, that's that's cutting edge. That's amazing. It's like, that's actually in a textbook yeah. 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Like it's just a fundamental work and knowledge of physiology that allows you to answer a lot of questions on your own rather than try and resource it. It's like the, it's like the difference between knowing and understanding. If I read a hundred articles, I might know a hundred things, but if I understand physiology, I can come to those solutions on my own. And because I understand the concepts of them, I can work them into the current context of that client situation mm -hmm. that allows your tools are so much sharper that way when you understand things rather than just know them. So then I took no break after college and went right into gold's gym. And then, um, I was, I was grinding. I think everybody knows anybody who's a personal trainer knows that you don't get into it for the money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you get into it because you love it. It's like, it's also like a systematically programmed way to have the worst schedule of all time. Yeah. So you have these morning clients and then this weird break before like your one lunch client mm -hmm. and then this weird break until people get off work at five. So then you're there for many, many, many hours, you know, 10, 12 hours, but you might get paid for five or six of them. And mm -hmm. even though that hourly rate isn't that hot because the gym's going to take a lot off the top at any Globo gym. Uh, so what I wanted to do, because I knew that this is what I wanted during all those longer breaks, I was actually um, doing online content before everyone was. So I was doing stuff online. Um, in 2010, 2011, 2012, way back then, posting every single day. And then I stayed on that grind for a very long time. And um, what happened was it, was, it was in 2015, there's this guy named Scott Prohaska. He's an unbelievable strength and conditioning coach in Southern California. And he had read an article that I, that I wrote on energy system training for hockey players. And then he called me, he said, hey, Dan, I've seen your work. It's fantastic. Um, I have 10 NFL and 10 NHL guys. Will you come down to Southern California for the summer to help me run them through their off season? And then like on the phone, like I was trying to act cool. Yeah. I was not cool yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. So I'm yeah. already not cool. So then trying to act cool is like the ultimate not yeah, cool. Yeah. But then I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll see the schedule. And then I don't even know what I'm going to charge. Of course, I don't have a schedule to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, but then I had to I had to figure it out. And then so, of course, I said yes. 
And then that was like a real tipping point for me because overnight, like bam, well, not overnight because it was many, many years in the process of, of being passionate and going all in on it. But um, I, I had this stable of athletes. And what happens at that point is you're in a situation where high pressure equals high reward. Now, did you relocate there? No, I didn't. I, I just, I would just Airbnb for mm -hmm. months at a time um, to work with athletes. But then I always went back home and then just coach them remotely. I'd be in their programming calls, videos, lab mm -hmm. work, that kind of thing. And then you get that high pressure, high reward situation. And that's what forced me to get into the labs. So that kind of go back to your previous mm -hmm. question of like, how, how do you, did you get to this point now? I, it molded, that pressure molded my approach. Because what kind of pressure? Explain the pressure so people know what you're talking about. Okay, so in 2015, I am coaching uh, Michael Bisping, UFC world, former world middleweight champion, right? Um, I'm working with him. Luke Rockhold is the current middleweight champion. And then Mike, call, uh, look at my phone, Bisping, comma, M. I'll, I'll pick, hey, hey, what's up, man? And he's like, Dan, got the short notice fight. Going to be fighting for the title in two and a half weeks. I was like, okay, shit. <laughs> How much do you weigh? And he, I think he said something like 213. And I was like, okay, I'm going to get something for you. We're going to start now. Okay. So, mm -hmm. he, so I, I have two and a half weeks now to get him from 213 to 185. So that's the kind of pressure mm -hmm. that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And it has to be 185.0. That is championship weight. And it's also the title shot. We need to maintain KO power. We need to maintain conditioning. We need to maintain cognitive function. We need all of those things in this type time frame. So then I'm given a set of variables. And then I'm paid to figure out those variables. So then that high pressure situation, same thing this past August. So Bisping actually won that with um, a left hook KO, knocked out Luke Rockhold's one of, the, one of the best memories in my career. And then same thing like, you know, this past August, Sean O'Malley, um, he, I've been working with him for about five years now and he KO'd Aljo, um, in, in the second round with a right straight. And, um, that's another very high pressure situation it has to be 135.0. And the thing is like, if, if they don't make weight, that's on me and that's millions of dollars, mm -hmm. many millions. This isn't, um, you know, um, getting second place at a regional bodybuilding show or maybe not looking as good as you wanted on your vacation. No, mm -hmm. this is like, I, I am responsible for tens of millions and sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars, like for my baseball players, for example, or, or hundreds, or if you consider career earnings, if you don't get that title, like it, it's very high pressure. So to deal with that pressure, I needed a way to be objective and unbiased in my approach. And, and it was my perception that the way that I can remove my bias and remove my client's bias and keep the progression objective was through labs. Mm -hmm. And then, so going back then to when you first started doing this, were, did you conduct the labs with them, that original 10? Yeah, I did. I did. But back in the day, it was super, super basic. Like I was um, still sharpening my own blades in that. I was looking at purely blood chemistry. And uh, I'm really glad I started there because blood, blood is absolutely the most underutilized and under-respected and most well-rounded um, set of lab work that you can do. I, I say underutilized because the, the value is not in the lab. The value is in the interpretation of the lab. I say under-respected because people don't know the magnitude of change that you can create in a physiology once you truly understand their blood from the inside out. And um, I say well-rounded because you are gaining an insight on somebody's entire physiologic picture in one shot. So for a stool test, I run stool tests very often on my people. Stool test is very valuable, but its value is quite localized within the gastrointestinal tract. Whereas your blood work, its value is localized in any organ system that has a blood supply which is all of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's why you yeah. get liver markers, kidney markers, brain markers, heart markers, immune, hormone, you name it. Uh, the blood is the communication and mailing system for the entire body. So you are able to look at this big snapshot picture of an entire physiology, not to mention it has the most amount of literature behind it. 
You know, there's a lot of functional medicine tests that look pretty and they have colors and diagrams <laughs> and stuff like that. And they look there. It's like they're it's almost like a cereal box. Like they're trying to sell you that it's healthy rather than just the boring broccoli that, you know, is healthy. Mm -hmm. um, a blood chemistry is black and white. And a, a lot of people don't know how to read it. But that is the most literature behind it. it doesn't need to prove itself to you anymore. It has decades of literature behind it. And it's so reliable and valid that it doesn't matter if you're in Ohio Hong Kong, Toronto, LA, you can get a blood chemistry. That is something that is worldwide because it is so reliable and valid. And the machines behind the accuracy of the processing for the results are the most sophisticated. You're not going to get the same variability as if you did some functional medicine lab twice and the results might be totally different. Yeah. So I started with blood chemistry and I'm so happy I did because I started with the, the hardest rock of science and application in the lab world. But it was kind of my job to um, figure out how to make it work for athletes. There was no one to talk to. I was like, there, there wasn't like a learn from me to do athlete blood chemistry. Like that wasn't around, you know, like the, the, like at least in my circles, like I did like, you know, Charles Poliquin's biosignature stuff. And like, uh, I was based on like fat calipers and precision nutrition. And then, um, I'm a functional medicine practitioner myself. So I, uh, I went through schooling there. Um, there, there was a lot of things that were very health-based that weren't necessarily performance-based. So I kind of had to just scour the literature myself and then use coaching experience too to, to form this, this athletic blood chemistry philosophy that I work with today. So the philosophy, would you say it's based upon their optimizing their immune system or, I mean, recovery would be optimizing their immune system. So it's the same, it, it, does it fall back to that? Um, man, so it kind of falls back to everything. I, I, it's, I hate that that sounds like a cop-out answer, but everything is connected to everything. That's like one thing that I've learned so strong in, in my in my career is that everything is connected to everything. So like, like an exercise that I could provide people is to type in an organ and then type in another organ and then type in the word axis. The, the organ to organ axis is mm -hmm. like everywhere. You get the liver thyroid axis, the pituitary gonadal axis. You get so many different axis from all of these communication networks that the body has. So you, you ending up looking at one fascinating functioning system. And perhaps I have a bias to say everything is connected to everything because when it comes to my guys, I'm really after 1% at a time. So like, I almost want to preface this whole podcast with the idea that little details aren't little to me because there's a hundred million dollars on the line. Mm -hmm. So like, if someone's like, ah, oh, just control your calories, ah, oh, just do IIFYM, that doesn't work in my world. Okay? When, when, you, when you're dealing with a millisecond margin of error, if someone's going to get a world record or a world title or not, um, you have to take advantage of absolutely everything that you can. So the philosophy that I've built over time with the understanding that everything is connected to everything revolves around the theory of constraints. So the theory of constraints suggests that a system is only ever going to perform to the degree that it is constrained. Mm -hmm. All right. So for example, let's use a business analogy. Um, an excellent CEO is going to be able to look down at his organizational structure and identify, right? Because a business is only ever going to scale to the degree that it is constrained. So he's going to be able to identify if there is a constraint in sales, a constraint in customer service, a constraint in team culture, a constraint in product quality. He's going to be able to identify the constraint and then remove that constraint so that the business can scale to the next constraint. Mm -hmm. That's exactly how I view physiology. So I am going to be looking at over 500 biomarkers through a large subset of labs from the inside out, but then I also have a very large intake process of questionnaires from the outside in so that I can get all of those things, understand everything connects to everything, and really just identify the current constraint that is holding them back from that next 1% that they need. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there'll be, with, with lab work, then there's... If I'm seeing this correctly, there's there's two philosophies. There's yours where you're going to remove the constraint. Then on another side, there would be let's mitigate what's wrong. Yep. Right. 100%. So there's there, there explain the two differences with that, because one of it is, you know, here's a medication just take or if D is an example If D's low, just take D. But that may not actually be what's creating the situation for that. Then they don't absorb that. Right. Yes. So. Uh, same thing with blood pressure, blood pressure meds and all those other things. So on one end, they're going to do the labs 
they're going to see what's off, then they're going to mitigate, mm -hmm. right? Yep. On your end, you're going to look at those labs, you're going to see what's off and then figure out why it's off. Yes. Yeah, a hundred percent. So there's always kind of a why, and that's um, anybody getting into the world of lab interpretation for performance. One of the greatest questions you could ever ask yourself is, "Huh, I wonder why the body thought that was a good idea." That's like one of the best questions you could ever ask, because many people take a recipe book approach to labs. This marker was high, so I need this supplement. This marker was low, so I need that supplement. Mm -hmm. They take a very recipe book approach to labs, and physiology is much more complicated than a recipe. What you're looking at on a lab is an adaptation. The body thought that was a good idea for some reason. Okay? Biology is infinitely smarter than us. So it's a much wiser question to say, huh, now I wonder why that came back high. I wonder why. What's it doing to protect itself right now? How is that the current adaptation to the current total stress load that the body has? That's like it, it, that will take you down a thought process to come to a root cause answer rather than a symptom management answer. Um, that's like the the recipe book approach is like you know something I always like to say to the students that I've mentored is the symptom is never the problem. The symptom is only ever the result of the problem. So I want to see what is actually the problem by going through this questionnaire and lab process, but then also start accelerating things. So like when you're telling me like, um, I want to remove what's wrong. Um, but then at the same time you want to support what's currently right. That's kind of like, um, you're going downhill and then you've got one foot on the brake and one foot on the gas. The first thing that we want to do is actually just take your foot off the brake. Yeah. That's the first thing that we want to do. And that's typically going to be, it could be, um, uh, let's just uh, go down the world of say micronutrients. Micronutrients can hold you back. Um, something that I've, that I've said a lot in the past to my athletes too is um, energy balance determines your body weight. Macronutrients determine what you look like at that body weight. But micronutrients determine how you feel at that body weight. Because the laws of thermodynamics will absolutely suggest that energy in versus energy out will regulate your body weight. But when it comes from a macronutrient perspective, somebody who's eating 2,000 calories of pure sugar versus 2,000 calories of an equal distribution of macros, most of the people are going to look very, very differently. Yeah. And then, then from a micronutrient perspective, the micronutrients allow you to maximally utilize the macronutrients. So like if somebody is low in magnesium, well, magnesium, that is very important for blood sugar control. So that can aid in ATP production during training. Magnesium, uh, magnesium is actually required in nine different steps for anaerobic glycolysis. So your ability to convert carbs into energy in an anaerobic environment, magnesium is required nine times in that biochemical pathway. So if I've got like a jujitsu competitor and um, he's like, man, I'm just, my legs are feeling heavy or I, I'm really running out of conditioning. What, what cardio can I add? I'm very big on um, identifying why you feel that way before adding more stimulus in. Adding more stimulus in um, at the expense of understanding why you're not actually properly adapting to your current subset of stimulus, which should already be good um, based on your current program. That's like, that's a, that's a real thing to uncover. So like magnesium can hold you back with respect to conditioning. Um, zinc, we, we know zinc, that is a, that is a, a, a mineral that's involved in something called RNA polymerase. Um, RNA polymerase is an enzyme that facilitates protein synthesis. So like we're having tons of protein for the purpose of forming new proteins on our body. But that process goes through the nucleus and then has to actually transcribe and to put new proteins on our body Zinc is a rate limiting process. So if we don't have enough zinc, then zinc is actually not going to allow us to maximize protein synthesis regardless. It, it, that is an enzymatic rate limiting step. End of discussion. You know, zinc, zinc as well. It's been demonstrated in research. This is actually um, uh, research on female volleyball players. Um, when somebody had a, was when she was rather um, zinc deficient, repleting her zinc status increased her resting metabolic rate by 900 calories. 900 zero, zero, by repleting zinc status. And that's because zinc is required for thyroid hormone synthesis. So her inability to have enough zinc to form enough thyroid held back her metabolic rate by 900 calories per day. So when I'm looking, we're working with an athlete, can you imagine if somebody didn't look for that? And then you imagine how bad her calorie deficit would have to be in order for her to actually drop body fat. She would be starving. She would perform terribly. She'd be wildly catabolic. And then if she didn't get results, what would the general community say? She's not following the plan. Yeah. 
She's not consistent. She's not disciplined. When really we have this giant thing that we can unlock. So like in that case, like you can really solve a problem. And then it, uh, and then I end up looking like some sort of genius because they feel better right away. But really, I just did the lab work to identify the constraint, fill in that hole. That person no longer has that issue and they're able to perform at the next level that they're supposed to f- perform at. So then why not just mega dump vitamins and minerals into your diet to cover all, overfill all bases? Um, well, so th- that requires a thinking process as well, because if we mega dump things in there, you know, um, you can create feedback loops that won't always work in your favor. So I guess vitamin D, that's a popular vitamin. Everybody's very familiar with it. People want to drive it up um, all the time. But um, there's research as old as the hills that suggests that you shouldn't do that. So you have um, somebody with, uh, say, uh, lower vitamin D, and they start taking 5,000 IU of vitamin D, and then uh, they get their next blood work done, and then that doesn't move. You know, the vitamin D is still low. And they just go, well, better move from 5,000 to 10,000. And I'm like, that doesn't even, that doesn't even make sense to me. How would, how would, that, that can't be the move. There's a, you're taking 5,000 IU. That's a significant dose of vitamin D. So the solution is not take a sledgehammer for more vitamin D. You have to identify why your body isn't uptaking the current vitamin D. What impacts vitamin D? Okay. So vitamin D, first of all, when you're looking at vitamin D in a lab test, you're looking at 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which is our inactive vitamin D. Our body converts that to 125 hydroxy vitamin D, which is the active form of vitamin D. So when you're only looking at one, you are kind of only getting one picture here. Because if somebody had, um, say, quote, suboptimal vitamin D, 25 hydroxy, they might actually have optimal 125. They might actually just be a very efficient converter. And it's actually been demonstrated that butyrate, it's a molecule, it's a short chain fatty acid molecule um, in, the, in the colon, uh, in the large intestine, that, in, that enhances the uptake or conversion of 25 to 125. So gut health actually plays a role in vitamin D homeostasis in the body. Vitamin D is also a negative acute phase reactant. So what that means is that in the presence of inflammation, vitamin D appears artificially low. It's a negative acute phase reactant. There's a lot of people who are quite inflamed who will have a negative acute phase reactant response and have a what appears to be a lower vitamin D, even though they don't actually have a lower vitamin D. Vitamin D also, it's uh, a lot of people don't know, it's um, very important for um, uh, mineral uptake. So uh, vitamin D is as big, in, especially with heavy metal, a heavy metal uptake. And it's already been seen in research that in the presence of lead, your body, as a protective mechanism, will lower vitamin D. Why? As to not uptake more lead. So if somebody has lead exposure because of plumbing, for example, and then their vitamin D just won't go up, and then what do they do? They want to have 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 IU. Your body might be protecting you, man. And now you're actually facilitating the uptake of what your body doesn't want. Right? And then in, on the inverse, boron's been demonstrated to increase vitamin D. Um, it, 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 uh, glutathione's another big player. Like this, this is one biomarker, by the way. But glutathione, um, it, it's been demonstrated that um, when you take a NAC, N-acetylcysteine, which is a precursor for glutathione, glutathione is so important for vitamin D metabolism that in those with low vitamin D and low glutathione, if they only supplement with NAC, vitamin D goes up with glutathione in the absence of additional vitamin D supplementation. So glutathione is its own rate limiting step. Mm -hmm. So when somebody says, well, why don't we just mega dose vitamins? Why don't we just mega dose minerals? It's not that simple because you might be mega dosing something that's ultimately going to hurt you rather than help you. So a fundamental understanding of what raises and lowers biomarkers is critical to your true optimization of nutrition and supplementation for your goals. Now, I throw that out there because it's, that's what across the board a meathead will do, right? Mm-hmm. They're going to hear this, right? Yeah. And maybe they'll understand, you know, fat soluble, maybe you don't want to overload that, right. but the water soluble, whatever, I'm to piss it out. Yep. Um, but at least it will top it all off. But in the example that you just gave, there can be all these other things going on that are associated with that. So with the athletes that you're working with, do you have to have – because you can do all the labs, but if their diet is just horrendous, 
to begin with, like two cheeseburgers a day or something fucked up. Right. Do you do you have a base plan that they go on first before that, or are you doing the labs immediately? I'm doing the labs immediately because I want to know what their physiology is like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. do. I actually, I want to see it fucked up. Mm -hmm. I really do. I, uh, I don't want them to like want to impress me. I want them to just stay on the way they're living so that I don't get a cloudy view of what might have otherwise exposed their root cause problem. Because if somebody comes in and they're current, I, I pull them off of supplements too, by the way. Okay. So I pull them off of supplements because many people self-select supplements to symptom manage their root cause. That's like, it's like, oh, I felt good on that. I liked that. It's a reason. You're managing a symptom, but not actually dealing with a root cause. So I'll pull them off their supplement so that that root cause reveals itself in its lab work. I want to see that. I don't want you to suppress it. Um, I also want to see what your body looks like on your current diet in the absence of supplementation so that I get the cleanest physiological view of who you are. And then once, you're, once your lab work is done, blood, urine, saliva, stool, once that is done, then I'm going to start implementing nutrition, supplementation, um, and anything that that athlete currently needs. But in order to, to get the cleanest picture of what's going to help them today, I need to know exactly what their physiology is today. Then where, how do you prioritize that first lab? Because it's, there's going to be more than one issue, right? So then you're going to have to have some type of prioritization of what's going to be addressed. Because I don't think you can address everything at one time, can you? No, 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 no. Um, you, can, you have the flexibility to address more things than once. I will say that because it's very common in the industry to, um, to say you have to pick one goal at a time. And you got to focus on that one thing, right? That's very common. I think that's actually a good approach for people who don't collect as much data as me. Um, because if you have access to more data, then you can make more calculated decisions about how things can move concurrently, right? If I know everything about you, I know what we can do concurrently and what we can't. Mm -hmm. um, but if I don't know anything about you and you just did like a basic intake and then I, I'm kind of guessing, then, then you need a clean signal in the noise to where only doing one thing is wise so that you can gain insight and feedback on that one thing to naturally progress it. Now, how do I progress things over time? Well, you're going to do all of your labs up front and you're also going to do the same labs. So I don't care if you're a PGA golfer or a marathoner, or a powerlifter, or a UFC fighter. You're going to do the same labs. I'm going to run you through that entire physiologic diagnostic process. And then from those labs, I actually phase out physiology in the same way someone does a, a program. So uh, everybody listening, they're very familiar with phasic emphases on periodization over time. You might focus a little bit more on hypertrophy here, a little bit more on strength here, a little bit more on power here as a linear progression example. Whereas I will actually um, basically prioritize different components of their nutrition and supplementation to maximize things over the long run based on a priority issue. So um, uh, what, what could be a good example of this? Um, it might not actually be advantageous for somebody to... Um, um, well, what would be a good example here? Um, to, to set somebody up in something that wouldn't offset it. We'll say, um, we'll say the infection, okay? Let's say somebody has a low-grade chronic bacterial infection. This low-grade chronic bacterial infection is going to impact gut health and is absolutely going to offset stress and catabolic markers. So if, si if somebody was unaware of this low-grade infection within the gut that needed to be eradicated and they only saw the stress markers within the blood, they might actually want to do some sort of lifestyle, adrenal gland, something work in this initial phase, which will only work so long as they keep doing it. Because the problem wasn't actually the adrenal glands with respect to the stress response. The problem was what caused the stress response. And that was that low grade infection. So this actually happens a lot. Um, people blame the adrenal glands for things. I've seen this a lot across my career as well. Um, but you have to understand, like if the, if the adrenal glands are producing a lot of stress, they are a reactant organ. They're not the root cause organ. That's like it's something that's like, it, it should be well known to where your adrenal glands respond to stress. 
they're not going to be the ones creating stress. So when you kind of front load that type of approach, um, I really do think it's only going to work so long as you keep doing it because you, you're only actually managing stress as opposed to eliminating the root cause of stress, which in this example would have been that low grade bacterial infection within the gut. So an example of prioritization post labs would be to put the root cause first and then after that, begin to actually stabilize that 2.0 version of that person. So in this, again, to kind of draw this out even further, I would remove that initial root cause, say through a generalized antimicrobial process to get rid of whatever that bacterial issue was in their gut, which is very common. And then after, they would go through a type of resiliency phase because it's not enough for me to just remove the root cause problem. I want to create a physiology so strong that that root cause problem has the lowest percentage chance of ever coming back again. So this is where stress management makes way more sense because in this context, that's actually when I'm going to get more revitalization out of the stress management as opposed to just maintenance of it because I never got rid of this thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So in that context, how are you defining stress? Uh, I'm defining stress as to whatever their current constraint is. So if somebody, um, I'm well, I'm going to define stress as anything that is suboptimal in the athletes that I work with, because anything that's going to be 1% is worth it for me 10 times yeah. out of 10. But if they come to me and they had gastrointestinal symptoms, like in this, to continue this example, if they had um, bloating, belching, constipation, loose stools, acid reflux, um, it, it's important for me to remove that initial stressor that's causing those symptoms. So that's how I would define stress in that context. Okay. So it's, <clears throat> it's building the resilience to that, right? So when it comes back in, they're, they're going to have this the same thing with just any mental type of stress, right? Yeah. You can remove the stress, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be better the next time it comes back. Right. And this was a hidden stressor in this context. Yes. Right. So stress is, um, it's very commonly, I'll, I use that terminology probably too loosely because stress is very psychologically and emotionally driven. A lot of times people, oh, that's how people's perception of it. But the way I program, I, I call it visible stressors and hidden stressors. Our visible stressors are from the outside in, so mm -hmm. psychological, emotional, environmental, things we can see and, and see and measure in our environment. But until you do a comprehensive diagnostic process of your body from the inside out, you'll never be able to see hidden stressors. Yes. And hidden stressors are what I have made a career on removing. That's my primary specialty is identifying what issue in the immune micronutrient hormone microbiome brain chemistry um, stress resilience like the cortisol to dhea ratio identifying what constraints holding them back from the inside out that allows that person to just slingshot forward All right so to jump back to what i was saying during my intro those how do those enter stressors impact somebody's ability to control and manage the outer stressors Okay. So like, how, how can the, your internal world impact your outer world? Yes. Yeah. So that, that's a great question. And those- Brain fog being one example. For sure. Yeah. And the, people might like struggle to like, hey, I wonder how, how does that work? But like, you just think like a hormonal imbalance, how different is someone's mood with mm -hmm. a hormonal imbalance? If somebody has a hormonal imbalance, how different is their sleep? Um, like a, a estrogen, um, a lot of people, uh, they, they don't know that estrogen is actually important for magnesium uptake, which is one of the reasons why women with menopause struggle with sleep so much. Menopause is the progressive reduction and then eventual absence of estradiol, but estradiol is actually important for magnesium uptake. So that person ends up struggling from a sleep perspective, from something from the inside out that is ultimately impacting something that is visible. Um, but this also works in reverse. And then they end up kind of going both ways. So like a, a good example that we could talk about here would be um, stress-induced hypochlorhydria. So if somebody has um, chronic stress um, from their total stress load, and this could be visible or hidden, but let's just keep it visible for the, for the sake of simplicity yeah. here. Um, if somebody is in a bad relationship, or if they are bothered by you not talking about world issues, <laughs> or mm -hmm. if they have, uh, or if they don't like their job, whatever it's going to be, if someone has chronic stress, that can actually create a state all by itself of hypochlorhydria, hypo absence of chlorhydria, stomach acid. 
So you can stress your way into having low stomach acid. This downstream actually limits someone's genetic potential by a significant margin because if you have lower stomach acid, your stomach is uh, your stomach acid rather is really going to do three primary things. Number one, it's actually going to close the esophageal sphincter. So you're st having actual stomach acid is the trigger to close the esophageal sphincter, which limits acid reflux. So somebody who actually has low stomach acid, that's actually what creates acid reflux rather than too much stomach acid because there's no primary trigger to close it and it remains more open and then it's easier for stomach acid to get in there. That impacts heartburn and acid reflux. Heartburn and acid reflux dramatically impact sleep quality because a lot of people get that heartburn and acid reflux when they're laying down. And then they don't know that they're being burned while they sleep and that impacts sleep quality. So if somebody has stress-induced hypochlorhydria that results in acid reflux, they don't recognize that downstream that's going to impact sleep quality and impacting sleep quality downstream is going mm. to impact about a hundred things. So that's one important component of stomach acid. A second important component of stomach acid is that it is the primary digestive juice that breaks down proteins into peptides and amino acids. So you aren't what you eat. You only are what you eat and actually absorb. That's important to remember. Digestive inefficiency will hold you back from being at your potential. And we have these different areas of our body that are responsible for different digestive processes, like the, this whole network and symphony of, of the gut. And this is kind of like a sidebar talk. I kind of hate when people just say, do a gut protocol, mm -hmm. because you have chewing, the esophagus, the stomach, the pancreas, the gallbladder, the liver, the duodenum, the jejunum, the ileum, the you know the 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 colon, your 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 ascending, descending, transverse. You have your gut bacteria. I mean, th this is what I just named like nine things. And someone's like, do a gut protocol. I'm like, for what organ, what system, and why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are you talking about? That doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. Um, I'm too like literal thinking for that. <laughs> it's like such a glow. It's like get stronger. It's like, what? Okay, hold on. Yeah, yeah it's. It, I, I I agree with you, but what are we gonna do? Um, but to to bring myself back on point here, um, uh, you aren't what you eat. You only are what you eat and actually absorb. So, like uh, pancreatic enzymes, like amylase, very important for breaking down carbs. Um, gallbladders, bile secretion, very important for emulsifying fat. So we're getting carbohydrate and fat uptake. But protein is primarily broken down by hydrochloric acid in the stomach. That's what's going to help break it down into peptides and amino acids, so we can actually utilize it for maximum recovery from training because if we're taking a ton of protein in post-workout to try and recover and we are assuming we have maximum digestive efficiency of that even though we're bloated and belching and have protein farts after um, you are not maximizing the utilization of that nutrient because you are not what you eat you only are what you eat and actually absorb so a state of hypochlorhydria is going to limit our protein digestive efficiency lastly there is a reason why the very first digestive organ food goes into is a vat of acid. And that is to protect us. Because even though we can't see microscopic things on our food, there are microscopic things on our food yeah. and they are gross. So our body as an evolutionary protective mechanism has this vat of acid that is supposed to kill all pathogenic uh, uh, invaders, we'll call them, so that they are destroyed before they have the potential to enter circulation. But in a state of hypochlorhydria, we are now more susceptible to infectious um, problems, such as a parasitic issue or a bacterial issue or a fungal issue, purely because our first line of defense networks is not as robust as it otherwise would have been. This will ultimately impact gut health, which impacts many things downstream. So when you're asking me, hey, what from the outside in can impact the inside out, which then also, also will reverse back out from the outside world, we have stress lowering stomach acid. Stress lowered stomach acid, which put us at risk for more infections. Ah, dang, I'm not going to be able to make it to the gym as often because I have fatigue and I'm dealing with these issues and illnesses. But then it also impacted my protein digestion and absorption. So now my recovery feels poor and I want to have more calories, but more calories wasn't actually the reason why I'm not properly recovering. And dang, I'm really not recovering because I have heartburn while I sleep and I'm not sleeping well, which is going to impact muscular and neural recovery. That is how stress can mess up gains, health, 
inside world and outside world all in one. And your ability to bah, 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 periodize that out, understand that your life was actually the root cause. Your life yeah. was actually the root cause. Oh, so that can become a circular problem though. Yes. Like, wh- how do you go about determining which is the greater influencer? I am going to determine what is the greater influencer by working myself through that entire process. You are able to look at labs and someone's questionnaire, and then that will begin to sing a song for you. I'm at a point in my career where I can just look at numbers on a sheet, and I know that person better than they know them. Like that's uh, the, when you've done, I've, I've looked at over a th- easily over a thousand labs in my career, and I know that person. I know what their questionnaire is going to look like without even talking to them. So when I'm looking at that, yes, I understand what's physiologically wrong. And then you end up kind of with different root causes um, because it gets more complicated than that. Because if somebody had um, a stress-induced state of hypochlorhydria that ended up in an infection, well, then the primary lever that we needed to pull was definitely to manage stress in their life. But if I start managing stress in their life, I've unfortunately still got this infection that I have to get rid of Mm -hmm. because now that's its own pillar. It's its own thing. Mm -hmm. So then I'm going to actually work on stress management and then prioritize physically what pillar needs to be worked on next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you go about managing those external forces with who you're working with? So if, if I'm working with somebody who has external force issues with respect to, say, stress yeah. or anxiety, then I think it's important, again, to identify the root cause of that problem while also being friendly to symptom management. Because I, I will utilize symptom managers with the understanding that they are managing symptoms. So something like um, uh, some of the most well-demonstrated things, let's, just, let's use anxiety. Let's grab onto that. Um, some of the most well-demonstrated things to reduce anxiety are uh, lavender. Lavender is excellent. Passion flower is excellent. Tart cherry is excellent. Um, apigenin is great. Inositol is pretty good. Um, we've got a, a L-theanine is another one. There's, there's a lot of tools that I can use at different times to lower anxiety, right? But why do we have anxiety? That's like, again, you still have to answer that question. Mm-hmm. And any real human performance coach has to figure out why. And, and everything I mentioned there, you know, all of those different things, they have their own like unique pathway to increase, say, GABA, almost for the purpose of sedation. Like you are calming this person down. But you run into a situation in life where the reason why you have anxiety can be because you need to actually rev up. Um, I've had situations in my career before and people have to look out for this because you can have a lot of anxiety because you're not getting shit done. Yeah. And that's, so in that, if you're not getting shit done, then I'm probably actually going to give you stimulants or nootropics so you can go get the shit done that you need to get done so that you stop being anxiety, having anxiety about the shit you haven't got done yet. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Any business owner understands Mm -hmm. that one. There is this list that you need to do. So if somebody has anxiety from a lack of productivity, well, then I might not want to lean on all these sedatives because I'm not actually dealing with the problem. Mm-hmm. I'll probably give them those in the afternoon and evening so they can still sleep better than they're currently sleeping because purely by will of forcing their biochemistry to be a little bit better in the presence of what anxiety is doing to their current catecholamines. But it is absolutely my job to point out to them the root cause of their anxiety and be blunt with them in a coaching way that, A, you are going to be, you have to utilize certain productivity strategies in your life to get this shit done. And we're going to use X, Y, and Z nootropics and stimulants in order to maximally facilitate the new schedule that you're creating for yourself, because the current schedule that you're working with is not working for you. Don't, that's really how I would approach that, is identifying what is the root cause of their outside in stressor and working with them to accomplish it. As so long as it's within my scope of practice. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. not talking anyone through trauma. No, no, uh, I get that. <laughs> that ain't me. Yeah. Um, but uh, I can, like, I, I'm not a psychologist. I never pretend to be, but I know a lot about physiology. And um, I, there are certain biochemical pulls that we can use in order to make that person feel better. And that's actually, there are certain things that you can do. Like in the world of, um, neurotransmitter optimization and brain health optimization, brain chemistry for performance. Um, there, there's a time and a place where you can actually, um, 
utilize nutrition to change someone's perspective. So sometimes the body is the is is the ultimate efficiency machine. So if I have a negative outlook on the world, the body will almost be efficient in having a negative outlook on the world. Now, this is something that that I believe. This is not something I'm referencing. Um, that if it, the body is like it's very efficient. So if my perspective is negative, then I will I will facilitate the biochemistry that supports negativity. And people get stuck in these loops. They they really do. Um, to where their perspective is then the root cause of their problem. But then you can use nutrition and supplementation. I can use, say, a, a nootropic and then certain uh, precursors for neurotransmitters and then a certain diet change. And then I can utilize biochemistry to allow this person enough chemical opportunity to see a new perspective of the world. And if I am able to facilitate biochemically the environment that's going to allow them the opportunity to see a new perspective outside of their current efficiency and the negativity that they're in, then you can utilize certain things in order to facilitate that to take place as well. And I think that's a giant, it's a giant key for high performers. If there's a commonality across the athletes I've worked with across, um, you know, uh, over a dozen professional sports, it's a high performance mindset. And dig into that a little bit more. What commonalities, how would you define that high performance mindset? A high performance mindset, um, any elite performer is going to perform with what they have now rather than what they want. One thing I've seen a lot of people with almost like a loser's mentality is like, I wish I had a better coach. I wish I was in a better gym. I wish that I had better training partners. I wish that uh, my genetics were different. It's like, you're never going to win that way. That's like, it's, it's, that's the, you can, an elite performer, like, you know, I, we've heard of the stories of Michael Jordan playing with a fever of over a hundred, Kobe Bryant playing with a fever of over a hundred. Um, Sean O'Malley, um, yeah, he, he, uh, he had a back injury so bad that he didn't grapple for six weeks going into his title fight against the greatest grappler in the division. Imagine that mentality. That Sean had Sean went in there ice cold. It didn't matter. He didn't grapple for six weeks, and he was going against the best grappler in the division. He goes in there nasal breathing, confident, throws that right hand and KOs him. Like that's a that is a different mentality. That is a high performance mindset where I am going to compete with what I have, and I'm not going to think about what I don't have. That's like a huge component of it. And athletes are also able to tap into a different, a different lens. They're able to, they're able to find a state of flow um, revolving around uh, arousal. If, if an athlete is too low aroused, then they're actually too relaxed. They're a little too apathetic. They're not going to perform their best. But also, if they're too aroused, then they're, they're, making, they're not patient like if a hockey player. He wouldn't be patient with the puck. He'd throw a pass. He'd shoot too quickly. He's, he's erratic. He's not thinking. But if you're in a state of flow, if you're in the middle, then that is the high-performance flow. And athletes, they, you, you see some of the greatest athletes of all time. They've all got that thing. They've all got that trigger. And um, like, for example, John Jones. John Jones is going to crawl into the octagon. Um, Anderson Silva, he's going to open his hands. He's going to bounce off the cage and then look at his opponent. George St. Pierre, he's going to sprint to one end, sprint back, and then start jumping. They've, they've all got these things that they do every single time that act as, it's, it's telling the biology, all right, showtime, lights are on, it's time to perform with what we have and nothing else. That's, that's getting into that flow state for those athletes, and they're able to do that in any environment. So if somebody wanted to, um, a tip from me um, for the purpose of a high-performance mindset based on what I've seen working with some of the highest performers of all time, it's that they have a routine that can be implemented anywhere. Um, it doesn't require a certain song. It doesn't require certain shoes. It doesn't require to be in a certain city. It doesn't require to be in a certain time zone. You know, those examples I just gave, they can do them anywhere, anytime. And that's what makes them be able to perform anywhere, anytime. Are there other things that you've seen as well that are commonalities? Um, mindset or physiology? Mindset. Mindset. Um, the, the activation of flow state anywhere is a big one. Not caring about what they don't have is another very big one. <laughs> Um, 
I, I suppose, I suppose, um, the idea that confidence is built through preparation would be another very big one. Um, when you talk about the greatest of all time, these guys work so hard. They work so hard and they're so disciplined. Like again, Michael Jordan, again, Kobe Bryant, Michael Phelps, like these people talk about never turning off. Like they don't ever turn off. Um, public speaking is probably a good example of this. Like, um, if I was to say, um, to the listener right now, Hey, you have to do a 90 minute public speech and you have to do it tomorrow and you have to do it in front of a 50,000 person crowd. They, they would probably freak out. I have to speak for 90 minutes in front of 50,000 people and I have to do it tomorrow, but I don't even like public speaking in front of five people. I don't even like doing karaoke. Like there's people that would absolutely freak out. And then 10 minutes before they're supposed to do their speech, I'd say, never mind. You are going to go out there, but you only have to recite the alphabet once. They would be this wave of crazy stress reduction. They'd be like, thank God. What's the difference? Repetition. They, they can do the alphabet like it's nothing. They are confident to do the alphabet because they said the alphabet a thousand times in their life. They, they can go through it like it's nothing. And I think every other skill is that way too. And I think the world's highest performers also know that. The more and more I am prepared, confidence is something that you build through preparation. It's not something that you have. It's something that you earn. So you do that disciplined fight camp. You do your disciplined um, Olympic four-year training cycle. You do your, your powerlifting meet. You know what numbers you can hit. Like the, There are people who, who, who winning is almost a decision for them rather than something that might happen. And that is, that is purely confidence being built through preparation. I think that that confidence through the preparation also bleeds in their, their ability to actually practice when they don't want to, yeah. right? Because there's this false assumption that all high performers want to do yeah. what they do every single day. Yeah. And that's, a, that's misleading yeah. by a lot. They just do it because they know they have to do it. Yeah. And if they don't do it, they don't like the consequences associated with if they don't do it. For sure. And it's, it's a matter of having pride, too. Like, um, I, man, I'm, like, I, I, I tell you, like, when I got laid off from that machine shop, I'm still a psycho. I still get emotional about it when I talk about it because I, it's so unrealistic for me to ever go back to a job like that at this point in my career. But I still get up and I'm, I, I'm absolutely not going back. I'll still say that stuff to myself because... Um, it's something that it's it's woven into me now to not give a shit how I feel about anything. I don't. I don't care how I feel because I have shit to do. Um, and I think athletes feel that way too, to where like I am I am absolutely confident that if there is a camera crew at my house and I woke up on Monday depressed and I woke up on Tuesday with anxiety and I woke up on Wednesday happy and then I woke up on on Thursday motivated the camera crew would not be able to detect how I felt that day based on what got done. What got done is what's going to get done. There is a list to do and I don't actually really give a shit how I feel. If there, if there is one feeling that I might be guided by, it would be pride. Um, and then as an extension of being prideful, I would be happy. If I'm seeking to just be happy, I'm probably going to get up and play PS5 and then I'm going to eat what I want. And then uh, I'll only do my favorite workouts. And not my not my least favorite exercises. Certainly not going to do Bulgarian split squats like that. That ain't happening. But there's a lot of things that I won't do if I purely just want to be happy. But if if I'm after being prideful, then I'm going to get done what I need to get done rather than what I want to do. And ending the day with pride is so much better than ending the day being happy because you you develop self respect that way. And that's how you actually reach your true potential. I believe that's the biggest takeaway most people miss. Yeah. Is that because the ups and down swings are, I have a good day. And let's say they have a, a they take Modafinil, they have a really good day yeah. on Monday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday isn't for shit. Right, right. And then the net at the end of the week is less yeah. than if they just did what they were supposed to do yeah. every single day, way less than yeah. what that is. But they'll, they'll rely on, that type of mindset or, oh, I got so much done here. I don't need to do it here, yeah. here or here. Right, right. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, ball gets dropped and then it's so hard to pick it back up again. 
And I think that's where, with a lot of the athletes that I've known, that's, that's the greatest fear, is if they drop the ball for too long, they're afraid they're not going to want to pick it back up again, so they're never going to drop it. Yeah. Yeah, momentum's huge. Momentum is a big thing. And I think that's, uh, that's why people, when they go on vacation, they come back. And it's really hard to restart the wheel again sometimes to get back on your training and get back on your diet. Um, I think momentum takes care of motivation in a big way because you're, you're just getting up and doing your routine. And I think that's actually, um, if I had to pick commonalities, again, we could kind of go back to that conversation. Um, if somebody wants to be a high performer in, uh, cause I've also worked with, um, uh, billionaire CEOs. I've worked with multiple billionaires. Um, I went to a billionaire's, um, house, um, just recently and did a uh, lab work for his whole family. And, um, so I, I've met with these high performers and I, I've had the luxury to meet these high performers in all these different areas of life. And like something I can certainly tell you is that, um, there isn't a recipe to success that any of them follow. What they have are characteristics of success. So the same characteristics that will get you a black belt in jiu-jitsu are the same characteristics that will give, have you a successful business, the same characteristics that will get you um, to be strong in the squat. They're the same characteristics no matter where you point them. If you have discipline, if you have delayed gratification, if you understand preparation, if you seek to be prideful, these people, they're not following a recipe for success. They are purely a reflection of their character. They're, it's not a program they're following. It's who they are. That's like the big component of it. If you can wrap your hand around having characteristic traits rather than trying to follow a formula, you're going to be able to point yourself in any direction like, that you want, like Joe Rogan. You're going to be able to get a black belt in jiu-jitsu and then be the best UFC commentator and then be a world-class uh, martial artist and then be a world-class comedian. He's, he's got those characteristics and have the biggest podcast in the world. He's got those characteristic traits that allow him to have success in any endeavor because it's not an endeavor. It's who he is. Well, who he is or who he became. Yeah. Right. So there's, there's the question. Yeah. Right. Because those that are 25 and under may not have developed those characteristics or maybe they do. Mm. It's a like nurture nature type of conversation here. Yeah where I think they can develop the characteristics. Yeah, I think that you learn characteristics by getting your ass kicked. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. that, that it's very difficult to learn lessons until you get fucked up. Like uh, if somebody uh, drives like an idiot, they're going to drive like an idiot until they get in an accident. Or if somebody drives way too fast, they're going to drive way too fast until they get a brutal speeding ticket. It's like we don't actually really learn lessons until the lesson is learned for mm -hmm. us that have you, if you're going to train like an idiot, you will until you get injured. Well, <laughs> there comes the conversation on stress mitigation. If you're dealing with outside factors, mm -hmm. right? Cause if you're always mitigate the, mitigating that, are you ever going to get in that accident or actually learn that lesson? Or do you have to lean into that shit and take the hits and be able to just keep going, yeah. you know, and learn from them. Yeah. Right. Because it's, and there, there's two camps on this. There's a camp that just wants to mitigate all that stress, right? Because whatever reason, you know, they just don't want to deal with it or a parent's protecting a child, whatever it's going to be. Mm. And, you know, that's all for good reason. Yeah. It's all for good intent, the intent's good. Yeah. But that what comes out of that, I don't think is, right? Because if, if, if it's a younger athlete and they're trying to, you know, mitigate all stresses, then do they ever develop resilience with outside the same thing's probably true inside too mm -hmm. as you kind of pointed earlier on you know if they're if they don't build that resilience then is that comment on instagram is going to still bother them five years later right right when it's not even a real person yeah yeah you, you know what i'm saying like yeah. people are yelling shit to a football player and the fans and they don't care this is an interesting one to me yeah you know they can yell shit at the quarterback and the fans and he doesn't care he's still got to go do the next play yeah but somebody can say something that's a complete troll that has no name to that same person online and it fucks their whole day up yeah so it's those are those things that i believe they need to learn how to mitigate not mitigate but they need to learn how to deal with that yeah you know because those little things seem to be what sidetrack a, a lot of the lifters that i know you know just from the powerlifting world that fucks with their head so much that it's un believable to me yeah. with that where i wonder if if you had that a thousand times this wouldn't bother you no 
yeah, th there's a magnitude uh, for sure. And that the uh, the comment thing is is so big because you could have 200 positive comments and one bad one. Mm -hmm. And where are your eyes going to go? Mm -hmm. Right to the bad one. And you're probably going to remember that the most and it's going to have the greatest impact on you until it progressively stops having an impact on you. You're able to develop that resilience over time. Um, that's kind of like what I mean when I'm saying you don't really learn lessons until something fucks you up. Like I think that you, when you're exposed to that, that's kind of the only way to learn lessons. Like it's it, shit is hard. It's really hard. It's hard to take risks. It's hard to do new things. Um, but that's always what's going to allow you to actually form a true working routine of the ca characteristics of delayed gratification, preparation, discipline. I think that these things, um, they, they aren't, they are who you become. Like you said, it's a better way to put it. Well, if you look at the top achieve the top achievers there and you look close enough, there's more failures than there are successes. Yep. But they the eyes only go to the successes. Yeah. Interesting because the eyes only go to the negative comment, but not the positive ones. Inter you know, yeah. it's it's a I gotta wrap my head around that one for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are many more ways to fail than there is to succeed. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Uh, my career has been a, a whole lot of that. Mm -hmm. I think that anybody's, anybody, any honest person has had a whole lot of that where you're going to have a bunch of stuff that doesn't work until you find the one thing that does. And then you can kind of go all in on your strengths in that regard. Um, but that like dealing with the, uh, developing a resiliency um, to go back to stress management it allows you to get way better results as I'm sure you've seen with your lifters. Cause like you're going to have two things, right? You're going to have your, your total stress load and then you're going to have your total adaptive capacity. Right? If we, ex if we have more stress than our adaptive potential, then we're going to run into states of overtraining or overreaching, mm -hmm. under recovering, whatever you want to call it. But the thing is, this is one bucket. So if we have one bucket, and we have, uh, we have this, we want to create like the purpose of us training in the gym is to have a directed stressor. So it is the purpose, like we are in the gym and the process of training is catabolic, but it eventually is anabolic if we properly adapt to it. And the only training worth doing is the training that we can maximally adapt from. But the thing is, this stress load is going to determine your degree of adaptation. So this kind of goes into the same thinking. What we're talking about right now is almost like an outside-in representation of my theory of constraints that I operate with. Because if you have this level of stress load and this level of adaptive capacity, but then my stress load, this much of it is being taken up by psychological stress, and then this much of it is being taken up by emotional stress. And then the final little bit here is being taken up by your training stressor. Well, in terms of my adaptive capacity, my training ad adaptation is now this small compared to what it could have been had I managed other psychological and emotional stressors in my life. And this is something that you see as a coach a thousand times over. You are not going to get the best results in the gym if you are going through shit in your life because your stress load is not being, or your adaptive capacity, I'll say, is not being utilized at this level of potential for your training. If we remove psychological and emotional stressors, then the primary stress that is coming in is going to be training. So we have a greater amount of quality stimulus going into a greater amount of quality adaptation. So our ability to remove psychological, emotional, or any hidden stressors is what's going to be able to remove that constraint from the total stress load, which then improves the adaptive capacity that we have. Well, that's assuming that the adaptive capacity of the athlete is optimized to begin with. Of course. Because that may be our, at 30%. 40% yeah. of what it should be, which is probably true with most. Yeah. It's not 100%. Well, this scales. Mm -hmm. too. If their capa capacity is here, then this stress load definitely is here, assuming they have an excellent adaptive capacity yes. for, through um, their nutrition, supplementation, current physiological health. I think health goes a long way in performance. They're typically talked about as two different things, but I think you are going to perform to the degree that you are healthy because you are going to adapt to the degree that you are healthy. Yes. Let's lean into that a little bit. So define healthy for the athlete, just the basic health part of that, you know, because it's to put some context, a reoccurring theme over the past year has just been, you know, lifters and anaerobic athletes still need to do a base level of cardiovascular fitness just right. for recovery, blood circulation, health, right? Yeah. You know, because without that, their their adaptive capacity 
lowers right. tremendously. Yep. And it's not a big ask to do fucking 7,000 steps or 10 minutes on a treadmill four times a week. Right. But it is, you know, <laughs> yeah. so some guys, nah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when, and, and that's assuming that the rest, you know, other health markers are in, on in check. So mm -hmm. how would you define just basic health? for those athletes because there's basic health for the general population which is pretty much for shit but you know yeah. for an athlete it's it should it should be higher than that for sure yeah like i mean aerobic health is a good example like if somebody has um, a little bit better aerobic health even if they're a super heavyweight power lifter that is going to improve capillary density it's going to improve work capacity because they have better work capacity they're going to be able to perform more training volume because they have better work capacity they're going to be able to recover more efficiently in between sets they're going to have a healthier heart they're probably going to have slightly less severe sleep apnea if they mm. are a super heavyweight power lifter um there, there are so many benefits downstream that something as small as having a simple base of aerobic health will do uh, my world um typically revolving around lab-based stuff if i'm looking out of bill of labs um, i don't want to see any major constraints holding this person back um, if somebody is is to, to kind of bring health into it i think inflammation is probably a good example that we could use um, inflammation you can look at several different markers um, you can look at say c-reactive protein which is acute inflammation you can look at uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which is chronic inflammation. Those are a couple of great blood markers. Um, as far as urine markers, you have lipid peroxides or 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine. Um, it's a mouthful to say, but um, those are both excellent uh, and well-validated uh, urinary um, inflammatory markers. There's a ton of them that you can assess to gain different insights in the body. But um, inflammation impacts blood sugar management. Then blood sugar management is going to impact your stabilized fuel supply during training so if somebody has an inflammation issue then they're going to have an atp production and energy issue during training so actually health for the purpose of inflammation management in turn resulted you in having a higher training quality due to having a higher net force output across the training session due to having greater stabilized energy levels not to mention inflammation is absolutely connected to increasing pain sensitivity in your joints so somebody who is more inflamed is going to have a greater amount of pain sensitivity in their joints. So you'll actually be able to move better if you are less inflamed. That's like I work with a ton of UFC fighters and they love working with me because one of the things I'm able to very effectively do is lower their total inflammation load and that in that improves their mobility through reducing the pain in their joints. So they're better able to execute things like sparring, strength and conditioning, um, grappling, wrestling, all this super high impact stuff that beats their joints down. But if you can effectively regulate inflammation, they perform so much better. So if someone is, is, is lacking in the department of health, there's always going to be downstream ways in which that impacts performance and adaptation. Because I'm confident that you are only going to you're only going to um, adapt to the degree that you are healthy, and you will only perform to the degree that you are healthy. Inflammation impacting, say, energy, and then impacting movement quality, like that alone, um, energy and movement quality, that'll, that'll crush you. An average person, let alone somebody who's after that next one percent. And then you start looking at all of the other organ systems and departments from the inside out. They all have these little downstream things because everything does connect to everything. Mm -hmm. I told you earlier, I'm going to have to take bathroom breaks. So well, this is one. All right, <laughs> let's do it. It's one of the best ways that you can support the podcast and your training is to join the crew. When you join the crew, you get an extra crew cast podcast every single month. <laughs> you also get access to our Discord, which has a training Q&A with Team Elite FTS members. You get form checks. You can upload any of your training footage and have your lifts diagnosed, sometimes within minutes, by multiple people. Access to close to 30 different eBooks, training logs, and first sign up access to our weekly weekend training retreats, uh, train your ass off, and other events that we do. Biggest takeaways from that though, what people enjoy the most and get the most out of is the training Q&A and the form checks as well as the extra podcast. 
Hey guys, I'm back in the gym with another limited edition apparel drop. This is the new Live Learn Pass On shirt. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about our cambered grip American cable attachment. This attachment has four grips and it's cambered. So when you flip it, it actually becomes eight grips. And if you turn it upside down, there's actually 16. This is one of our most used cable attachments out in the gym. <clears throat> even got that full range of motion we got a second limited edition drop this month as well head over to elitefts.com pick up the shirt pick up the cable attachments and we'll see you next time matt with elite fts I'm here at the armory in columbus ohio this is a new build beautiful facility should be opening up around november 1st 2023 looking at the posterior chain developer signature version it's gonna have the logo panels on there reverse hypers you can do glute ham raises back raise um, any kind of posterior chain movement you want to do on this piece this is really good the best thing about this so you just step down on the release adjust the so it makes it really easy to adjust these no pop pins or anything of those sorts so this is the signature Posterior chain developer by EliteFTS.com. Americ Health is a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. Are you looking to optimize your health in and out of the gym, improve recovery, sex drive, and quality of life? Have you tried speaking to your health professional about this and have gotten the cold shoulder, stereotyped, or just told as part of getting older? You just go to AmericHealth.com backslash table talk and you can create your own lab or you can take labs that we've had set up for them, which are based upon the same labs that I've been doing over the last 15 years. Or you can use their guided optimization. With this, they'll put you in touch with a patient care coordinator, which is actually pretty cool because you get to sit down and speak to somebody that can understand what you're looking for from hormone optimization and the preventative and medicine standpoint. After that conversation, they'll determine which labs that you should and which tests you should have done. And then from there, get the labs done. They'll review those labs with you and put you in touch with one of their hormone optimization specialists that can determine which supplementation that you should use over the counter or prescription. AmericHealth.com backslash table talk. The discount code is table talk. All right, there's so many places to go here. So I got all these notes with the, I'm just going to take certain certain things and throw them in and then have you comment on how it positive and negatively can impact right so um <clears throat> caffeine for instance so the, let's no let's let's go a different route pre-workouts right so the pre-workouts for an athlete <clears throat> it can be used I, I I push against those sometimes, right? <laughs> Actually, a lot of times, because why is it being used is the, the, you know, the first question. Yeah, and because that would be systemic of something else that's potentially overreaching. So, like, why is that in there in the first place? And then, but from the internal system, if there's, you know, they become assimilated to it. So there's the stupid shit like a thousand milligrams of pre-workout caffeine yeah. with all the other shit into their system to be able to get through the training <laughs> i get it and i was stupid enough to do shit like that and i'm sure we all were at a certain age you're just looking for the the highest bang that you can get from that right. but downstream what are the implications of that yeah, we all we all did that at a at a certain yeah. age. Because yeah. there, there's I mean, pros, yeah. there's cons, right? But it's all kind of it's dose related, timing <laughs> yeah. related, physically related. I mean, it's a big conversation it can become here. I'm just laughing because yeah. I, I take a lot of stimulants. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'd be a total hypocrite mm -hmm. if I said I didn't. Um, so I, I think I think in, I think a few things about this, and I think context matters a lot. Um, so first of all, um, when you actually do look at the totality of literature, and this will get people mad, but I absolutely can back it up. Um, you can for long term use. Use, caffeine can be used at 400 milligrams a day uh, before it really starts tripping things, say like blood pressure, heart rate, or catecholamines, these types of blood sugar outcomes. Um, people can take more than they think. Um, there's people who demonize coffee even, which I think is insane. Like coffee is um, it's actually underrated. It's one of the most well-demonstrated liver health supplements anybody could ever take. There are unique antioxidants in it that are, that are so powerful. They help in things even like uh, fatty liver disease outcomes and um, antioxidation, um, steatotosis, that's a uh, fat buildup. Like there's so many things that coffee is so beneficial for the liver, but then things like 
milk this will get a lot of press for whatever reason but um you know coffee having like 100 milligrams it's plus all uh, the antioxidant load and the giant amount of health benefits like i think sometimes people just create content for the purpose of making noise rather than making sense you think (laughs) (laughs) for for real because like you know how many studies that you have to go through on coffee that have a positive effect before you find the bad one so you have to you go through like a hundred studies of positive benefits on coffee, and then find one bad one, and then someone makes a podcast on it. Mm-hmm. It's just that stuff like that kind of drives me nuts. Um, but um, in, in the context of using, say, stimulants prior to training, you're uh, you're on the money because stimulants are a phenomenal way to mask fatigue. Why are you fatigued? <laughs> there is probably something going on with your diet. There's probably something going on with your sleep. There's probably something going on with your training or some combination of all three that has forced you to utilize chemical stimulation in order to rock up and get this thing done. So that is absolutely a diagnostic process that shouldn't be taking place. You shouldn't have to have a pre-workout in order to go do something that you want to do. You're the one who wants this goal. So why do you need that? Why do you actually need that in order to go make this thing happen? There's a certain disconnect there. At the same time, um, this is something that I'll just say from a coaching experience perspective. Um, and it's with my athletes. They're very ritualistic. So sometimes you can actually change somebody's routine for the better. And then it worsens their performance rather than makes it better. Mm-hmm. Um, an example that I've used in the past is um, Sidney Crosby. He's a, he's a phenomenal NHL player for many, many years. Um, he is very well known for having a peanut butter and jelly sandwich before hockey games. On paper, is that a great pre-workout meal? No. Or a pre-game meal for the best hockey player in the world? No. I could go in and be like, you know what? We're going to have this, 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 and this because, you know... I know you're the greatest hockey player, one of the best hockey players ever, but you don't know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, first of all, I'd be a wildly arrogant coach to say that. And the second, he, because of his ritual and routine, I could scientifically optimize his pregame meal and worsen his performance because he has taken out of his flow state. Mm-hmm. So if somebody is using their pre-workouts and it is a part of a true ritual that they do that's very important to them, so long as it's non-toxic, like if it's not a thousand milligrams of caffeine and it's 300 or less, I mm-hmm. think would be a good, uh, 400 is still quite a bit. Even though the literature does support that, I still just think from coaching experience, it's quite a bit. I like to keep my guys less than 300. If it's non-toxic and it's ritualistic and they enjoy it and it's not impacting health markers, the cost benefit for me, I would actually let that go. I, I would. I would let them, I would let them use um, pre-workouts on, on an as needed basis, not every day, but certainly on an as needed basis. Well, if it was every day over a period of time, it's going to take a higher dose yeah. to be able to get the stimulant effect. Right. Yeah. And even if it's in there frequently, how do you get them to downregulate the milligrams that they're able to do? Do you pull it away to put it back in so- or are there other supplemental strategies? On paper, you can actually completely reset your sensitivity to caffeine after 11 days off. So this is something that I would actually implement with that person. Can you do 11 days? Yes, coach. Mm -hmm. Done. That's something that I would do. And then even in replacement of that, we can use something like alpha GPC or tyrosine or new peps. Um, something of that nature to provide some sort of neural stimulant while we avoid this adrenal stimulant that they have been using. So we would do 11 days off. And then after the 11 days, you would be freaking amazed at what just 100 milligrams of caffeine feels like. Yeah. Your, like your first medium coffee that just blew your world. <laughs> well, that, that can be built into the phasic structure of their training as well. Yeah. You know, so if it's a peak, then do they really need it the two weeks after wherever they just peaked? Right. Or if it's a fight, you know, if it's after the fight, do they or really a vacation. need a vacation, whatever? Yeah. You know, it's all in there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I would be more inclined to utilizing that type of, um, you know, rip the bandaid off resensitization strategy rather than a progressive reduction. Because I think that, um, that that kind of just delays them feeling better. Because I think the progressive reduction, they wouldn't feel as good for a longer period of time. Whereas if I can just, hey, can you do this for 11 days? That's almost like a challenge for them. They get through it and then we're done after 11 days. Mm-hmm. And then we, we don't have to go through that staging down. Because um, I think that that would kind of just, I don't know, I see it as the same way of like um, 
like reverse dieting. You familiar with reverse yep. dieting? I never do that. I've never done that with my clients. It's like you're sustaining the, so when you're in a hypocaloric state for a long period of time, um, hormones like leptin, uh, ghrelin, testosterone, insulin, estrogen, thyroid, all of these things are in a state of metabolic adaptation and as a result of hypocalorism and you're systemically catabolic. So then somebody gets to this peak hypocaloric state where they're in extreme caloric deficit from going to a, say a bikini show, for example, and then their coach is asking them to just do this like 50 calorie increase or like I've seen some ridiculous stuff like 50 calories or the hundred calories. And they do this like super slow step up to me. Like, you are prolonging a hypocaloric state. I, I've always been big. on just, I put that person right back to maintenance right away they, they go up, they go right back to maintenance the next day. And then cause of what I want to do is recover and so for lack of a better phrase balance that hormonal milieu and that biochemistry to get back into a place that is offsetting all of the negative implications that happened with hypochlor hypo extended hypochlorism so in the same way that i just put someone back at maintenance to offset the bad thing that just happened or not bad but that to offset the adaptation that just happened i do the same thing with caffeine yeah, what what i've seen what i've seen in that the dieting structure what i've seen and what i've done is a third variable which is 50 pounds back on in a week you know which yeah. probably isn't the best thing but you know <laughs> you can make the argument that it's not the best thing no i can make the argument <laughs> it's not the best thing but <laughs> i see i did it three or four times and it's you just can't quit fucking eating you know well yeah, i could if i chose not to but you just you have no control there your appetite is ridiculous up in there man and your ability yeah. to just pull it in is ridiculous yeah and it's i think i just saw a youtube video last larry wheels put on like a ridiculous amount in the first two days yeah but i think he also had to cut real hard so that's a little deceiving mm -hmm. when you do that i mean your fighters could sit there and say that they put on 40 pounds yeah, you know yeah, but yeah. did they really right. um uh, so let's let's stay with that because sean just how much did he have to cut? Yeah, so Sean, I can tell you the exact numbers. I got him, um, he's weighed in at 135 for his championship fight. That afternoon, I had him at 158. What was he 14 days out? 14 days out. He, he's typically hanging in between 151, 154 mm -hmm. in that. But he, he, we were 14 days out. Like that's because he's really one week out. Like he's really seven days out when you say that, because the final seven days is media week. So, like, so that's when you start. Like, yeah. So like okay. the, the final seven days is media week. So he's not going to be training much. He's going to be doing a million interviews because the dude's a superstar. And um, the weight cutting process for me, depending on where someone's weight's at, I'll start them seven to 10 days out depending on where they're at. Um, but like 14 days out means only one week left of real training. Yeah. Yeah. So like he's already um, very lean and very dieted at that point. And he'll typically be, yeah, between 151 and 154 in that, in that line. At that seven days? Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So you're, you're pulling weight off throughout weeks before that as well? Not really. No. Okay. So like, uh, and I like that you said weight, um, cause yeah, there's a big difference here. So, um, <laughs> how the process works is you, you'll typically, what I like to do is, um, this will be a long winded answer. <laughs> um, is, well, I'm interested because he's yeah. got to maintain cognitive function too, if he's doing interviews and shit like that. Yeah. I I've, um, I've really dialed in weight cutting strategies. I, I, I do it very well. Um, because Sean's a good example of that. So his cognition and wit and shit talk and all those interviews is still on point. Yeah. And then also, um, one thing that happens when you cut too much weight is you lose your KO power. He's not. He's mm -hmm. one of the best knockout artists in the UFC. Another thing that can happen when you don't do your weight cut properly is you don't have a gas tank. You lose your conditioning. He set an all-time world record in band and weight for most strikes landed in three rounds. Mm -hmm. So conditioning, cognition, KO power, I have that man completely dialed in. Um, and what I like is I actually like a fighter entering fight camp, like uh, whatever, eight to 12 weeks out, depending on where they start. I like fighters coming into fight camp about 80% in shape. 
just to pr pr put a weird number on it. No, I like, that makes sense. Yeah, I want them coming in 80% in shape because if they're already 100% in shape, there's nowhere else to really go and they end yeah. up actually overtraining. Yeah. Like overtraining is something fighters will do and they're so tough. They just grit right through it until they get injured. Mm -hmm. They're just so, and then even when they're injured, they keep going. I see the same thing with power lifters. If they're, if they're too strong too soon, yes. the net result is always injury. Right. So I actually, I want to actually strip some body fat off of him. I want room to move and groove. I want room to to uh progress so he can be motivated by his performance going up and his weight going down at the same time these are all like very good psychological things that he can grip onto and feel like a fucking machine in camp so then the, i like them coming in at around 80 percent. we're going to lose some weight throughout camp and then um when the weight cut process starts it is it is very phasic in its progression to where uh about let's say like seven to 10 days out, one of the first things that you want to do is pull carbs. You don't reduce calories, but you pull carbs. So I can actually just increase fats and drop carbohydrates so that we could lose all of that glycogen weight. Because so I'm sure a lot of the listeners are familiar for every one gram of glycogen you store, um, you are going to also store three to four grams of water along with it. So fat will not do that. So if I have somebody at 2000 calories, and then I take their carbs away, but increase their fats, they're still at 2000 calories and still at a good amount of protein. But I'm going to get a solid eight pounds out of that, like a very solid, um, easily. And that's just going to slowly happen over the next seven days. Um, so that's the first phase. Yeah. Yeah. I call them, um, uh, passive versus active weight loss strategies. So you're going to do passive things where weight kind of just falls off of you. And then you're going to do active things near the end where you're getting it off. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the intelligent approach to weight cutting is maximizing passive approaches and completely minimizing active approaches. So passive strategy number one is to reduce carbohydrates to initiate glycogen loss to get tons of weight loss right out of the gates. You're going to do that, say, seven days out, which is fine because you're not supposed to train hard anymore anyways. Mm -hmm. So we don't actually need that additional fuel. We're going to use that as, as, a ver as a great tool to lose a bunch of weight passively. Mm -hmm. And then we're also going to start our water loading process. Um, we actually want to increase your water dramatically. Um, and you're going to do this, say, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, if you have a Friday weigh-in. You can do this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You're going to increase water quite a bit because it's going to offset uh, ADH or uh, antidiuretic hormone. And you're, you're actually able to, to trick the body in a way to where if you're consuming a ton of water, then your body um, manipulates this antidiuretic hormone and you are going to start peeing a lot because your body is seeing all this water coming in and then it wants to pee it all out. The problem or the, the advantage rather is when you stop drinking water, it takes your body over 24 hours to recognize that you stopped drinking that much water. So you will keep peeing as if you were drinking that much water, even though you're not repleting it. So what happens is he will, have, he will water load Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I manipulate that hormone, and then I don't give him a lot of water on Thursday. He is going to keep peeing like he did on Wednesday, but I'm not going to be reloading his water. So then passive strategy number two, boom tons of urination happening on Thursday via manipulation of antidiuretic hormone. So now we have lost a ton of glycogen. We have lost a ton of water. I'm also going to be um, utilizing certain fibers during this uh, fight week period as well to eliminate GI residue. Um, so any type of fecal matter, the fiber acts as a real brush of the gastrointestinal tract to where I can pull as much as I can out of there and in combination use some laxatives if I need to. Um, something like Miralax. Miralax is a super good option to um, take some great poos, and then you're able to get <laughs> you're able to get one or two more pounds purely out of that. Mm -hmm. So then, between glycogen, water loading, um, fiber use, uh, laxative use, if I need to, um, I'll also utilize sodium manipulation, where I'll sodium load and then pull the sodium for the same reason of thinking it's retaining and then blasting it all out. We've got electrolyte, uh, Miralax, or sorry, electrolyte laxative fiber, glycogen, water loading. We've got five passive strategies. And then actually all of them are in peak form 
on Thursday. And Thursday is what I call whoosh day because that's when I've pulled your water. That's when we've pulled the salt. That's when we might use Miralax if you need to, depending upon your weight. Um, that is uh, the day where all of those, you're maximally glycogen depleted at that time. Thursday is whoosh day. So I'll regularly have guys, um, let's say, uh, let's just say a bantamweight. So let's say somebody who is 135. Um, they will be, say, close to 150 all the way up to Thursday. And then like, if somebody who hasn't worked with me before, they're like, coach, this is heavy, mm. man. Like this, I, I, well, how are we going to do this? I'm like, trust me, Thursday's boosh day. Chill, mm. man, just chill. You're still water loading. That's why you yeah. have this much weight on you right now. Just relax. And then Thursday comes around and they're like, oh my God, like they're, by the hour, they're getting lighter and they're getting lighter and they're getting lighter. And then uh, I, I, I probably won't even have them utilize any active strategy in the morning because I want to see how much weight they lose until the evening. And then in the evening, um, that, that's still, I'll utilize active weight loss strategies based on a uh, progressive um, uh, need of, of stress tolerance. So like a very low stress active weight loss would be to put some sweatpants on and put a sweatshirt on and get in the bike. I really like mm -hmm. the bike. It's, it's pretty common for some fighters to get sweatpants and, and sweatshirt on and start shadow boxing. But I, I, t I kind of steer them away from that because the purpose of this workout is not to become a better boxer. The purpose of this workout is to lose weight. So let's do something with zero impact. You should just be on the bike. We'll do, we'll get in the bike and we will, uh, no running either, like a zero impact. Uh, we're, we're severely dehydrated right now. So we're going to go and we're going to utilize that strategy. We're going to get lots of weight out of it. And then after that, if we want to increase the stress load on the body, if we need to, that's when you would move into the hot tub. And then if you still needed something after that to get another reason for your body to keep bringing out that sponge, then you would move to sauna. But it's very common for my fighters to never even need the sauna anymore which is crazy for fighters to hear because they're, they're dying mm -hmm. all week. They're dying. And my guys on Thursday passively are through five different strategies are losing almost all of their weight. And then we'll do sauna the night before. And then I've also already calculated their night loss. So we typically lose say two pounds overnight just because that doesn't, that doesn't change because you've already taken so much water out. It surprisingly doesn't man. It, Interesting. It'll Why change. do you think so? You just still pee. It's, it's probably the antidiuretic hormone thing still mm -hmm. taking place. Uh, I can just tell you from coaching experience, like I won't talk mechanistic pathways because like it'll be different, but it's not crazy. Like let's say they lost three to four pounds of water um, eight weeks out. And the, but the night before weigh in, I'm still probably going to get two pounds out of them. That's interesting. But yeah. <laughs> I'm still going to get two pounds out of them, um, probably due to antidiuretic hormone. And, uh, and that's, that's about it. And then, um, they're going to go to sleep and I'm going to give them some, I'm still going to give them fruit and some food before bed so we can get a better sleep because, uh, we're, we're, he's just going to be, um, I'll probably go have him go to bed around five pounds over. Cause I know he's going to lose two pounds just because overnight. Mm -hmm. And then we'll do the last three, the moment he gets, uh, the moment before the scale, cause I want him to be maximally dehydrated for the shortest amount of time possible. And then they weigh in at 135. He's 135 for all of five minutes. And then yeah. I have them rehydrate through a, a it's, it's another very calculated process to get them back to where they need to be without gastrointestinal distress, edema, or diarrhea. That's like its own, its own whole battle too. Can they use diuretics? No, no. Diuretics and IVs are illegal. In, IVs are? IVs are illegal, yeah. Yeah, you can't use them. No, for anything. Wow, even post, you can't. Nope. You used to be able to. So then what? Back in the good old days. <laughs> yeah. All right. So so what do you do post then? Because that's usually your first first route. Right. You know, is IV and sipping on fluids. So yeah. what is your first route then? Yeah, yeah. No. Um, when the more... Wow, that sucks. Dude, the, when, when the more serious drug testing started coming around, um, IVs can be used to mask drugs. So they took IVs out. Wow. Yeah. Now the diuretics, I get that. Like you, you right? Th there, there's a risk there mm -hmm. because it still may be working. Yeah. You know, after you cut weight, there's a. I've seen that with lifters a lot. You know, it's yeah. the dumb fox 
you know, they'll use the oral instead yeah. of like it's some fast acting thing. Yeah, yeah. And they're trying to put weight on it, just fucking keeps coming off. Mm-hmm. It's like you stupid shit. That happens but, in <laughs> fighting if they take too many laxatives. Yeah. Oh, it's still it's still they coming still out. Work. Yeah, they yeah, just keep yeah. Shooting. yeah. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. Um, but the IV blows my mind because I mean I don't see anyhow they can't. So yeah, that would. All right, so anyhow, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I can't believe that's fucking illegal, dude. It's it's seen as a as a way to cheat because you can mass drug use. So that's just that's just what it is. So mm-hmm. we had to work work away work around it, but um, um, we did. When do they test though? Uh, randomly, like it, it's at any time. I mean, what fucking drug are they going to take in the last twenty four hours? Hey. Test. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Anthony too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Jesus Christ. All right. Anyhow. So, all right. He makes weight. Then what? Then Somebody would probably uh, fucking do that. Man. Oh, I'm sure. You know people. <laughs> I know. I know. If there is a dumb thing to do, the dumb person. That's no, I've do seen it. fucking giant hematomas from test ethanate three days out. Why? I guess for the recovery after the meat. I don't fucking know. Yeah. For yeah. 15 <laughs> days from now, yeah. I'm going to feel like an animal. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's stupid as fuck. But <laughs> any, 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 yeah, I can go on about stupid shit like that. But yeah. So now you're, so you're, are you leading with water, electrolytes, or how do you, do you have shakes? What do you? So we're leading with three mil of test and anti. Yeah. And then, yes. <laughs> yes. Right after. Right after. You're right, <laughs> yep. The longest dehydrated shit you can do. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, no. Okay. Okay, so fucking pellets. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I'm going to I have I have my guys do um three shakes in the first hour. Um so typically um I've been my own little proprietary blend, mm-hmm. but it'll be a, a combination of a certain amount of water with electrolytes, whey protein, vitargo, glutamine, creatine. That's like this little blend that I'll throw together. Um, I don't believe I've left anything out. Sodium? Um, the electrolytes. Okay, so that's yeah, a yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> so I've got tons of, I've got protein, electrolytes, glutamine, vitargo, creatine, um, and a certain amount of water in there to make the solution um, for, for a digestive assimilation um, uh, max, maximized. And then um, as you, that's a big point of it too. You want to have enough water to act as a, a as solute versus solvent, so that it doesn't just sit in their gut, and they have transporter ability to get it out of the small intestine and into the body. But I'll give them their first shake um, immediately after the scale, and uh, don't hold back. You can chug that all immediately. Have that as fast as you can, and then I'll give them their second shake, um, which is looks nearly identical, but they just they don't need creatine anymore. So I'll just pull that out. Um, and then I have them, that's when I want them to slow down. So you have this second one and you're going to just slowly sip on it for 30 minutes. So make it last 30 minutes though. And then I'll give them their third one and I want them to make it last for the next 30 minutes. So within that 60 minutes off the scale, they had one instantly, one for 30 minutes, and then another one for 30 minutes. That by itself, between the combination of carbs, electrolytes, and water, their weight is up significantly at that point, and they feel freaking great. They feel fantastic. There's nothing is coming back out of them. It's like they're coming back to life. Everything is going where it should. Their eyes and face even look different. They, they lose that gaunt mm-hmm. look in their face like they're almost going to die because they are mm-hmm. almost going to mm-hmm. die. Um, so yeah, that is coming in um, the one hour off the scale after that, that's when I'm going to be switching to food. So when they get an appetite again, um, after that third shake, I am very big on a very high meal frequency with small servings. So we'll just have these very small servings of, um, low fiber and low fat, but about a one-to-one ratio of carbs to protein. I do low fiber and low fat because both of those things slow down digestion. And right now we don't want slow digestion. We want uptake back into the muscle cells, back into the body, back into the brain. You can dehydrate the brain. So we want to uptake everything with as minimal GI distress as possible and as fast as possible. So that doesn't mean fat and fiber is bad (laughs) before people jump on me and take this way out of context. It just means it's bad for this particular context. Mm -hmm. So then I'll have them have a small meal um, or snack about once an hour. So uh, every hour on the hour, we're going to get in something. Um, And it could be a meal, like a protein and carb. Or if they're feeling like, I don't know, coach, then I'll I'll actually dial it back. And it might just be um, blueberries or it might be oatmeal um, or it might be baby food. 
Um, these are all really good things to take in that just have no gastrointestinal distress on them. And then we're going to get up, 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 up until you hit your pre-weight cut weight. Once you hit your pre-weight cut weight, eat as needed. Um, a very important rule though that I would want, I'm talking in the context of fighting, but it, this is applicable to all power lifters. Anybody in a weight cut sport, I would do the same thing. Physiology is physiology. Um, one thing that I would really want you guys to, to not forget after weigh-in is you want your stomach to be a half full gas tank. Okay. So it should never feel empty, but it shall also never feel full. You want to maintain that sweet spot of your stomach being like a half full gas tank. If you can maintain that sweet spot, your nutrient uptake and minimization of gastrointestinal distress and plumbing emergencies, that is, that's what's going to optimize that. So that's, that's the, in a nutshell, my entire approach there. I'll have them salt their meals, um, those smaller meals, until they get to their normal weight as well, just a little tiny pinch. And then you typically have a smaller amount of water, not a crazy amount, um, but like eight to 10 ounces with each meal, and then just sip on it a little bit in between meals as well. And then they're going to be back up at their weight. Like I had, uh, Bisping was another one. I had him that, so he weighed in at 185, and then that afternoon he was 203. So I just have these guys. I have that system very, very dialed in. I I assume these are foods that they've been eating the whole training camp. Yes. God damn it. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> God damn it, dude. So, uh, so f some fighters think that the weight cut, that means they won the fight. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. It's like they, they weigh in and it's like, I fucking weighed in. And it's so crazy to me that somebody would eat at a restaurant that they haven't eaten at in their life the day before they're about to have the fight of their life. Like, it's so crazy that you only should refuel with what you ate during camp. Because what you ate during camp, we know agrees with you. But you see so many fighters and athletes weigh in and then go to a local restaurant or go to a buffet or get the new supplement that they've never tried before, but then it was supposed to be good for hydration or something. That shit drives me up the wall. Because you're literally, the moment before you're about to perform, you are adding in a new variable, which makes no sense at all. None. No, yeah, it just, it's maddening. Mm -hmm. So, and then it can happen though at a different level too, because then influencers, like they don't understand, like someone will like want to do like a sponsorship deal with someone, They're like, let me take you out for dinner. And then like the person wants to have a business partnership so they go out for dinner i'm like no do that fucking after mm -hmm. it has to be after you have to focus on eating only things that agree with you so yeah sport i'm so glad you asked that it doesn't matter what sport you're in you do not have your celebration meal until it's actually time to celebrate with with that weight cut you mentioned you know the steam maybe right because it's you, there, there's active and passive, oh, right? Right. right, right. Yeah. So staying on that, but just moving into just training and using different active and passive recovery modalities. Mm -hmm. What would be the difference between steam, sauna, hot tub, cold bath, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Because a lot of people will implement these in, you know, to their training right. for recovery. Again, I'm going to dial that back and say you first need to ask, why do you need to implement this in? Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. is there something with the training? Now, there are times in training plans, no matter who it is, with the exception of maybe entrepreneurs and stuff like that, where overreaching is going to be in there. Right. And so that would have a reason to be able to plop in there. But I don't think with those different modalities, people, I think they're just shotgunning them out there. Right. And they're not really thinking of the mechanisms behind how each, each work and the the negatives the costs right. associated with each one right so recovery strategies um how i like to think about recovery strategies is by thinking about them as if they're a recovery menu so like the what we're trying to do is you know we have our parasympathetic which is fight or flight and sorry we have our sympathetic which is fight or flight and our parasympathetic which is rest and digest so with these recovery strategies we are trying in some way to down regulate sympathetic activity and up regulate parasympathetic activity we can do this with a sauna with massage with breathing techniques with meditation with gratitude journaling there's so many ways in which we can utilize recovery strategies i like to implement a recovery menu with the athletes that i work with one on one 
why do I like to incorporate a recovery menu? It's something that, again, I'm, I, I'm speaking from coaching experience, so this is just my opinion. I think that you can adapt to your recovery strategy. So, um, and then I don't think it's as good as it was. So for example, if you get in the cold tub for two minutes for the first time, you are going to create a massive amount of shock proteins and, and all of this cascading cytokines, all these things are going to happen. Um, you do that for two minutes the very first time. And you do it again the next day. You do it again the next day. You do it again the next day. It's very difficult for me to continue mm -hmm. to believe that we are going to keep repeating the same physiological response when we know from training that you can't just do the same thing every day and accept the same adaptation to happen over time. Yeah. So the way my brain works, I just thought, hang on, we're doing this for the purpose of creating a biochemical cascade and we're assuming that it's the same every time. I don't like that. I'm not going to agree with that out of coaching experience. So what I am going to do to try and offset that is I'm going to create a recovery menu for my athletes that they self-select what they want to do. And I think that that's way more effective because if you self-select the recovery strategy that you want, it minimizes the potential that they can adapt to the recovery strategy that they're doing, but it also maximizes their adherence because there are some days where I don't want to fucking meditate. Mm -hmm. I don't. And then I'm going to sit there for 10 minutes going, this fucking sucks. I don't mm -hmm. really want to meditate. I have shit to do. Like, I, like, and I, I can't truly enter that state of transcendence that you want to get into. But I could have done a, a quick breathing routine. Or I could have done a um, Normatec pants. Or I could have done it's something else that I wanted to do. So my, my belief in buy-in is up. My adherence is up. My enjoyment is up. And my adaptation to the recovery process is down. So I feel like that recovery menu is a great way to maximize true recovery without adapting to your recovery. It's a weird thing to think about, but it's how I think. Um, and uh, I, that's, the, that's the, the strategy that I've used with athletes. And um, I understand the positives and negatives of these different things. They almost don't need to when it's a menu mm -hmm. because they're going to be doing different shit anyways. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the way in which I've approached that. What do you think about something like that? Uh, when I was competing, I um, was doing a lot of seminars as well, and I did many of them with Mel Sif. Mm -hmm. and oh, that's cool. We had one conversation one night at his house forever, because it's kind of how he was. Yeah. And we were speaking about these different recovery strategies and how to put them in. It's the same thing that you just said. He said, you, you know, your body can tend to adapt to whatever those are. Oh. So in the off season, Use as many different ones as you possibly can to figure out which ones actually help you the most. Holy shit. Then when you find those, pull them and then don't use those until you really need them when you're overreaching training for the competition. You know, so I found certain ones and um, uh, sauna was, it's aggressive, yes. right? Because yeah. it's, but it's fast, mm. you know? So that the, with that, the mitigation for me there was just keeping a cold towel on my head to keep the blood pressure lower so it didn't spike as high. Right. You know, that helped, but it was, it worked better for me than uh, steam or uh, than sauna. Right. Like sauna's long, it, it was longer, right. right? Then contrasting, I had access to a health, I was a trainer in health club, so I had all this shit, yeah. you know, right there. So I'm trying different contrast, different contrast times, all this other kind of shit during that time period, then would fall on a few that it would help because I'd use them after a max effort day with Louie, right? Because you feel like you're going to die the next day. Yeah. So I had an indicator to be able to know this actually made me feel better or didn't make me feel better. Okay. Yeah. And so I, I saw those all more as passive, yeah. where active would be, you know, sled drags and just concentric only gotcha. work or aerobic yeah. work and stuff like that. Yeah. And that's how I would kind of periodize yeah. those and then always be on the look for different things because I was always scared that it wouldn't work yeah. when I needed it to work, yeah. you know, from that perspective. But you, you go down that, it's a whole other rabbit hole right there as well, right? Because if I, and to go back to what I said earlier, if I had to start using those things like 12 weeks out, something's fucked. Like yeah. th this, this is not good. Like right. there's, there's, there's a problem here. And what is that problem? Then it, I would go more internally. Like this is, is, is a nutrition is my body weight, you know, are the drugs too high right now? Like what, what variable can I control here right. to fix this shit? Cause this doesn't have a good outcome. You know, I need to dial it back to be able to go into that type of thing there. Yeah. But 
Yeah. It, it's <clears throat> now people tend to now, from what I see, they'll pick one, you know, now ice baths are popular. So it's that, Yeah. you know, they'll pick that and then it's all the time. Yeah. And I tend to think the same way that you do. Like at what point is this really not even going to, at what point is it not going to, at what point is it going to stop actually helping? But if you continue to keep going, is there going to become a point it's going to hurt? Right. Because yeah. training would do the same thought, probably like training would do that. Yeah. If you keep blasting the same stimulus over a period of time, it's going to go the other way. Yeah. Drugs, the same, all everything does that. So why would this be the one outlier? You know what it's I'm not. I don't, <laughs> you know, I don't know, but it, it's, it seems to be pushed that way. Yeah. You know, at least with that one and it just, it's trending, it's popular. So it's things fall in those cycles. Yeah. If you've been around, you've been around forever. So you, yeah. it's just the new one. So what, what's yeah. it going to be two years from now? You yeah. know, a few years ago it was infrared saunas. So, okay, cool. Who talks about those much anymore? Yeah. yeah right. Yeah, so yeah. it kind of comes and goes, yeah. but they're all tools. Everything is a tool. Yeah. yeah. And a tool is only ever as good as it is applied. Yeah. And that's like, that's a thing of knowing versus understanding old dogs that have been in the industry for a long time they see things that come and go it's all just tools to us yeah. how, how we apply them is is what's going to determine the the maximization or utilization of that tool regardless of what the hell is currently trending yes. that means absolutely nothing but yeah dude those recover having that recovery menu like and sometimes it's so different like one of the best things that i could do in my entire life for recovery is walk my dog like i go out and i get about 25 minutes of walking in i get sunlight and they get all the oxytocin from being with my mm -hmm. golden retriever. Like, I think that's like one of the best recovery strategies that I could possibly do. So it doesn't have to be a thing. Like it doesn't always, if that makes sense, it doesn't have yeah, to be a proto no, protocol. No, no. You could just love to walk outside with your family or love to walk outside with your dog or whatever it is. Um, and then the timing is critical too. Um, cause I actually, I don't actually like saunas post-workout. Did you do it post-workout? Mm -mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because we're on the same page then, because when, when I'm, thinking in terms of like model-based thinking. Post-workout, what do I want to do? I want to do the three R's. I want to do repair, rehydrate, refuel. Mm -hmm. If I can repair, rehydrate, refuel post-workout, then I am optimizing my physiology for accelerating recovery from the stress I just placed upon it. So why then, if, I, if I'm going in the sauna, then I'm delaying rehydration, which is not ideal. But then also it's been demonstrated that increased heat environments deplete glycogen. This has actually been seen in the Olympics. Like when going to Rio de Janeiro for the Olympics, there's a greater rate of glycogen depletion and greater fatigue at events in hotter environments. So I am in a sauna, I'm getting, I'm delaying my first R of rehydration. And then I, I'm delaying um, and, and minimizing the maximization of my refueling, which is through glycogen depletion of being in a hotter environment for an extended period of time. And then lastly, from a repair perspective, the final R, well, even slight states of dehydration have been demonstrated to increase cortisol. And then cortisol was already quite high from the training event. So in a way, I'm, I'm and not necessarily going crazy catabolic, but I'm certainly not maximizing anabolism by being dehydrated and depleting glycogen and then creating catecholamines that are, that are responsible for catabolism. So in terms of refuel, rehydrate, and repair, um, I think the sauna is a great tool, but the tool is only ever as good as it is applied. When should it be applied? Not post workout, in my opinion. Well, I didn't like to have anything really post workout because I didn't know if it was required or not. Mm -hmm. When I wake up that next morning, I'm going to know what's fucked up and what's not. Yeah. Right. Then I'll know. And if, or if not, you know, yeah. if it's not, then nothing is going to be implemented because the body's doing what it's supposed to do. Yeah. In the way it's supposed to do it. You know, if I got to expedite it, which is kind of what we're talking about, <clears throat> then, then I'm going to need that. You know, the same thing would have been if it was more active mm. like the sled work uh yep. banded good mornings or whatever all that was to do was to work whatever body part felt like it got hit by a fucking club yeah you know just to get <laughs> yeah. circulation in that thing just move it yeah. you know but i'm not gonna just move everything if it's not required did you it, have certain tools that you loved the most like certain things that you thought were like this is this is the one like depending on what was fucked up you yeah. know so if my shoulders are banged up from the max it usually it was after max effort yeah you know, it was a, the most damage would happen yeah then the sled work you yeah. know just front walking front raises just anything to kind of move through that 
I, essentially you're removing the eccentric because as your arms drop the sled doesn't move yes you're still lowering your body weight of your arms so yes there is eccentric but not loaded from yeah. that part That's so <clears throat> that that helped a lot you know and it helped a lot with i had a lot of pec issues mm -hmm. you know so on the that following day if that was bound up felt bound up a reverse band press that was zeroed out yeah so it didn't weigh really anything but i the trick was to learn how to do a hundred repetitions without your triceps burning yeah right and so now the band pretty much has to do all the work because if you just flex just a little bit yeah a hundred reps of anything of anything you yeah. know is going to start to burn oh, i just yeah. wanted that the greater repetition that helped a lot that one movement there and it, it actually i don't want to say it ceased any pec tear reoccurrence mm -hmm. But it was part of what ceased, yeah. whatever it was, because you can't say one. It's, it's never just one thing, right? You know, yeah. the, people are not very educated. They think it's just one thing that you know created that. It yeah. could have very simply been it was long enough that it wasn't going to happen anymore. Yep. You know, so there's that factor too. Yeah. Um, but with uh, I did notice a, a difference when I quit working in the club. And didn't have access to those things, mm. you know, the steam, sauna, hot tub, stuff like that. I wasn't able to replicate that with cold showers or contrast showers or any of that other kind of shit. Yeah. So that created, you know, having to go to a different health club to be able to, <laughs> to, yeah. be able to do that, which became more inconvenient because I'm running the business out of my home at that time. So it's like, oh, fuck, now I got to find time, you know, just to be able to go do this. But it was already kind of staged that it was only when required anyhow. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so that's kind of how I manipulated those. It's interesting you talk about the sleds. The yeah. Sleds. I um, I uh, I coached Mark Bell this year to run the Boston Marathon, mm -hmm. and um, that was like one thing he wouldn't let go. Like, and I didn't try to take it away from him, mm -hmm. but he was like the the sleds for him. He loves sled work in in any kind of different direction for the purpose of recovery and training as a whole. Like he yeah. he sees so much value in the sled work, and it's really something I haven't messed with myself or really much with my athletes. It's not heavy. I use like a quarter. I mean, it's not yeah. a lot of weight. Yeah, you know, it's just the movement of that. You know, and it's <clears throat> I haven't found a way. I'm sure there are mm -hmm. you know ways to simulate it you know to where there's loading but then not loading on the eccentric but yeah. that's <clears throat> works I mean, it's interesting that he wouldn't let it i let that go a long fucking time ago <laughs> did you <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah there's a lot of shit that i did back then i don't ever want to do again <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. you know that was that that's not one that falls into that bucket but it kind of going around with that reverse hypers i'll never fucking do again yeah. you know you, you just do so many of them over so long a period of time it's just like nah man i'm I'm good. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't care how fucking sore. I, I'm good. Dude, no. that's I'm I'm in wash up meathead status now. <laughs> Things that are joint friendly is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I fucked myself up a lot doing dumb shit as a young fearless lion, mm -hmm. and now I'm just training joint friendly. That's, well, that's that's the tricky part, right? That's with the whole training in general is you can get away with it when you're younger, and I don't necessarily know how much advice we need to give younger people that are doing that to not do that, yeah, because they still are going to do it anyhow, you yeah. know, so it's a weird it's a weird balance with all that, yeah. but the trick is to know when to stop doing it before you are forced to stop doing it, yeah, a hundred percent you know yeah. the the like, person who is going to be the strongest is the guy who is able to string the greatest amount of quality training sessions together without getting injured, yes. That's true. That's the, the higher the power lifter gets, that becomes the biggest advice I get yeah. is not all things are equal at that level, right? Some are still going to be stronger than others, mm -hmm. but there's a variance of say five or 10%. The healthiest people will beat that variance. Yeah. You know, the health, there's going to be accumulated damage. It's probably true with fighters and everything else. They're going to go through camp. There's accumulated damage. That's normal. Yeah. Right. And nobody's going to go unscathed no. by the time they get to whatever competition or event they're going to do. It just comes with the territory. Mm. But to minimize that is the key. Yeah. Right. And that can be these recovery, recovery modalities. But more importantly, I think now in today's world with access to blood work and shit like you're talking about yeah. earlier, that's huge. Yeah. You know, that's that's right. Simple easy shit if you have somebody that's kind of advising you and walking you through that yep. to be able to a lot of those recovery modalities may not even be fucking needed 
yeah. if there's other things that are happening internally that isn't allowing for the uptick of the nutrients. If your gut's fucked up and you can't absorb nutrients, yeah. there's a problem, yep. Yep. right? Which is the stool things that you're talking about there. I mean, that there's a big problem. Oh, yeah. Right? So, that, I mean, your blood work, there's a question for you where well, you're doing them all now at one time, right? right? Where before it was just the blood, right? How many times do you think going back that that blood had you had that gut information or however you went, you know, would have changed the blood, the way that you are navigating the blood work? It changes it quite a bit um, because you are able, because so the, remember when I said previously that like the blood gives you uh, instant access to the entire body as a whole. I like to think about that as like a detective coming up to a crime scene. A detective comes up to a crime scene and he's going to not zone in on the first clue and then begin to solve the case based on the first clue. Mm -hmm. What he's going to do is he's going to probably look at the crime scene with a wide lens and he's going to start to see multiple things happening at once and begin to try and create a consensus and a story about what's happening with this current case. I think about blood a lot like that. You are able to have this wide view of all these different clues at once, but nothing always exactly telling. And that's when actually, that's what grants you the license to Maybe the root cause is in saliva. Maybe it's in urine. Maybe it is in stool. I'm looking at so many clues and I can form an unbelievable story and consensus here. Sometimes I'm probably going to be able to, to nail it right away with just the blood. But there's a lot of confirmation that you can gain from other biomarkers as well. Um, a good kind of uh, telling draw that, that you could utilize here for, for this answer would be the cortisol to DHEA ratio. This is like something that is uh, uh, one of the most underrated components of performance blood work, um, because it is the stress resilience cascade in the body. If you could look at the anabolic to catabolic ratio, it would be cortisol to DHEA. If you could look at stress versus resilience, it would be cortisol to DHEA. The, the pathways, they are, they are literally, they begin with the mother of all sex hormones, which is pregnenolone. Pregnenolone is going to go either left to support catabolism, it's going to go progesterone, cortisol, or it's going to go down to promote anabolism or the reproductive side of the equation, which is DHEA, androstenedione, testosterone. So it, long story short, like to DHEA, or sorry, pregnenolone, is only going to go left or down. And that's based upon the current biochemistry of the body. And it is either preferring this stress pathway to make more cortisol, which over time, leaves less pregnenolone to be made for this DHEA. So when you're measuring this DHEA to cortisol ratio, you are very much assessing stress versus resiliency. And this cortisol, technically DHEA sulfate, the cortisol to DHEA sulfate ratio, you are looking at stress versus resilience. And uh, the ratio that you want between these two is uh, less than 0.09. So I know that number sounds weird, but the data is what the data is. You want that ratio to be between 0 and 0 0.09 when you're dividing cortisol into DHEA. This matters dramatically because as DHEA is progressively declining, it is your insight that this has been a preferred pathway for cortisol for an extended period of time, or this would not be depleted. And when you assess these in the literature, this ratio, DHEA is anti-inflammatory. DHEA is the precursor for testosterone, so it's, it actually allows you to make testosterone, which is one of the reasons why testosterone and cortisol have an antagonistic relationship with one another. Um, DHEA is also the precursor for the estrogens. So despite popular belief, estrogen is anabolic and it is anti-catabolic. It's very important for bone density. It's important for fat loss. It's important for many things. Um, but what you're, uh, you're looking at precursor potential, you're looking at an anti-inflammatory hormone, uh, DHEA is also important for our immune response, which, as you know, is wildly important for recovery. DHEA also protects the brain from the negative effects of stress. Um, it's been demonstrated that as cortisol increases in a chronic sense, it actually creates oxidative stress to the hippocampus of our brain. So the hippocampus is the memory center of our brain. And if cortisol increases over a chronic period of time, it creates oxidative stress directly to the hippocampus of the brain but not if there is enough DHEA present. Now, DHEA also protects the brain from the negative effects of stress. 
So you're teasing this thing out. I'm like, holy. So this is like when I'm unpacking this, I'm like, how the hell isn't anybody talking about this? Because mm -hmm. we're talking about a ratio that represents immunity, that represents inflammation, that represents precursor activity for the other reproductive hormones. That is also something that is protecting my brain. That is a good representation of anabolic to catabolic stress versus resilience. Why aren't we talking about this? Why aren't we emphasizing this? This is a, a key key takeaway that I could have for people. Um, it, it is said that there are big rocks, right? There are big rocks in health. Like if you, the, the things that are almost obvious that provide hundreds of benefits. So you should eat better. You should sleep better. You should stop watching so much porn. You should get off your phone as much as you're on right now. You should manage stress. These are big rocks to live a better life. On lab work, Cortisol to DHEA is a big rock. I could tell you that from experience. That is a big rock. You solve that one, hundreds of other things just magically are like, okay, we're pretty good. And what I've found in my practice is that is a predictor of optimal recovery. So you're talking about, hey, if I need this recovery strategy 12 weeks out from a meet, I am fucked up. Yeah. But we do your blood work before then. That would never happen. Because we'd be able to identify, you're not going to actually survive the next 12 weeks. You're not. <laughs> this mm -hmm. is because this metric you're not, you're going to keep depleting that and it's not going to work for you. So in my practice, I've seen it be an excellent predictor for recovery. I've seen it be an excellent predictor for that purpose of injury resiliency as well. And how it kind of ties into the question you asked me is like, how can another lab impact what you're seeing in the blood? Well, when I, if I'm looking at the blood and I'm looking at this stress resiliency cascade that's way skewed in the wrong direction, is it because of your psychological and emotional or your training? I'll be able to see that. If you're if you live in a fucked up life or you're on a fucked up training program, then that's probably the problem. But if those things are dialed in, it's probably why you're seeing me. Mm -hmm. You're probably saying, "Hey, coach, I feel like I'm doing all the right things. Like I really don't think it's this bad, and I've done this before, and it hasn't been a problem. But things aren't moving the way they used to. What's going on? Yeah, that then it's probably a hidden stressor. You are plateaued for a reason that is not currently explainable because of your current good routine and habits. So then that's what I want to get saliva, stool, and urine, because something's hiding in there. I see the biochemistry of a suboptimal human and the habits and rituals of an optimal human. So what's, where, what am I missing here? Mm -hmm. I'm going to look elsewhere and I'm going to find that answer. When I find that answer, I'm going to solve that problem that's going to remove the constraint and allow that person to perform at the next level. Going a little different, going off topic, when, when I was in college, I took a nutritional biochem class, right? And one of the most interesting things that stood out to me, and this was, I didn't have any chemistry or biology when I took this, by the way, and did well in it, surprisingly, because I was interested <laughs> in the topic. That's yeah. a takeaway there. Yeah. You know, if you, if you study things you're interested in, they're a lot easier to actually learn that was like me in college and, terrible in high school yes finally got yeah. good grades in college because i gave a shit <laughs> I, I remember the one day they were, we were going over you know how protein digests mm -hmm. you know from the mouth through the stomach through the villus you know into the amino acid gene right yep. and what hit me is at the time the gym i was training at had all these different amino acid blends with the perfect chain yeah right and i'm like yeah wait a fucking minute <laughs> yeah. right yeah 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 right so um, explain you know how that process of breaking protein down goes from the mouth into how it's going to be utilized either as muscle or converted for energy yeah i mean that is a good, another great example of knowing versus understanding when you're able to immediately look at a marketing thing, you'd be like, that doesn't make any sense based on known biochemistry. Yeah. yeah. Like this isn't going to pass through like that. No. Yeah. yeah, I know. This perfect chain. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't do that. This is human <laughs> distribution of amino acids. Mm -hmm. This is what it's going to do. Um, no companies being mentioned, but I remember that one too. It was amazing. Um, I'll actually recommend, um, I read this book a long time ago. Lyle McDonald wrote a book called The Protein Book. And um, to this day, it stands as an outstanding resource for mm -hmm. all things protein and really all things nutrition. It's a great book in general, period. Um, but when somebody is taking some like unique blend of amino acids, first of all, it doesn't matter at all if you're having one gram of protein per pound of body weight a day. It doesn't matter at all. That this has been demonstrated to the point where like it's not even fun busting the myth anymore. <laughs> it's kind of like insulin makes you fat. 
Like I've, that myth has been busted so many times that it's not even fun anymore. <laughs> um, the, the amino acid one, you are going to be taking in a certain subset of amino acids. If you're, if you're at one gram of protein per pound of body weight a day, it already doesn't matter. So that's just already out the window. But even if you have this unique blend of amino acids, you are going to be taking in those amino acids. The degree of your gut health is going to determine a lot of efficiency based on those amino acids. We also know efficiency in terms of digestion for animal proteins versus plant proteins is different. And then by the time it gets to the liver, the liver is taking an enormous percentage of those amino acids for its own resources, for organ health, for distribution, for precursors, for many different things that it is going to be doing. Doing. And then that is going to be taken into the body for amino acid pools into certain localized areas for muscular development. It is going to be used in the way that the body wants to use it. It's not going to be used based upon how the marketing ad yeah. <laughs> claims. Straight to the biceps. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's not how physiology works. Your physiology has a hierarchy and hierarchy goes survival biceps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's how this works. So that is, it doesn't matter what real chain that is being brought in. You can make some nuance um, points about that. Like, uh, you know, say, say uh, two grams of taurine being better for reducing cramps, um, at least three grams of lutein, leucine for protein synthesis, um, at least three grams of glycine for maximiz maximizing sleep before bed. There are like little unique things that have been seen in the research, but in terms of the totality of how digestion works, yeah, there's not this perfect little chain that just going to float through and go <laughs> right into your muscles after training. <laughs> not at all. Oh, yeah. Glad you said that. <laughs> yeah. Let's take another break real quick and then we'll come back. Cool. It's one of the best ways that you can support the podcast and your training is to join the crew. When you join the crew, you get an extra crew cast podcast every single month. You also get access to our Discord, which has a training Q&A with Team Elite FTS members. You get form checks. You can upload any of your training footage and have your lifts diagnosed, sometimes within minutes by multiple people. Access to close to 30 different eBooks, training logs, and first sign up access to our weekend training retreats, uh, train your ass off, and other events that we do. Biggest takeaways from that though, what people enjoy the most and get the most out of is the training Q&A and the form checks, as well as the extra podcast. Hey guys, I'm back in the gym with another limited edition apparel drop. This is the new Live, Learn, Pass On shirt. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about our cambered grip American cable attachment. This attachment has four grips and it's cambered. So when you flip it, it actually becomes eight grips. And if you turn it upside down, there's actually 16. This is one of our most used cable attachments out in the gym. <clears throat> even got that full range of motion we got a second limited edition drop this month as well head over to elitefts.com pick up the shirt pick up the cable attachments and we'll see you next time matt with elite fts here at the armory in columbus ohio this is a new build beautiful facility should be opening up around november 1st 2023 looking at the posterior chain developer signature version it's gonna have the logo panels on there reverse hypers you can do glute ham raises back raise um, any kind of posterior chain movement you want to do on this piece this is really good the best thing about this so you just step down on the release adjust it so it makes it really easy to adjust these no pop pins or anything like those sorts so this is the signature Posterior Chain Developer by EliteFTS.com. Fumeric Health is a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. Are you looking to optimize your health in and out of the gym, improve recovery, sex drive, and quality of life? Have you tried speaking to your health professional about this and have gotten the cold shoulder, stereotyped, or just told as part of getting older? You just go to AmericHealth.com backslash table talk and you can create your own lab or you can take labs that we've had set up for them, which are based upon the same labs that I've been doing over the last 15 years. Or you can use their guided optimization. With this, they'll put you in touch with a patient care coordinator, which is actually pretty cool because you get to sit down and speak to somebody that can understand what you're looking for from hormone optimization and the preventative and medicine standpoint. After that conversation, they'll determine which labs that you should and which tests you should have done. And then from there, get the labs done. They'll review those labs with you and put you in touch with one of their hormone optimization specialists that can determine which supplementation that you should use over the counter or prescription. AmericHealth.com backslash table talk. The discount code is table talk.
All right, we're back. What I'm going to have Dan do is on, I believe it was Mark Bell's podcast, the second episode, there's a two-part thing that you did with him. On the second one, you broke down his blood work. And what I wanted you to do, we're not going to break down my entire panel because it's huge, Right. is to go through certain things because the takeaway that I had watching you do that with Mark is it's kind of the same way Dr. Serrano goes through mine. Mm -hmm. And I've also had other people go through as well. And the way that you do it and he does it is not how other people do it, yeah, right? Yeah, so, yeah. and just going through some of these markers, I think will give an indication of what people should look for mm -hmm. if they're not coming to you directly or right. just come to you directly because there's, this is just blood here, right? So there's not the, the other variables as well. <clears throat> so they get a better idea of the bro yeah. that they're going for yeah. to review their blood work yeah. is just the bro. And not somebody that really knows what's going on at deeper levels. Yeah. So with that in mind, just jump in with where you want to jump in. For sure. Yeah. The whole bro thing or trying to learn how to interpret via Google is <laughs> never a good thing. That's so it. You can run into more problems, like as demonstrated by some of the stuff we've already talked about in this podcast. There's uh you can run into more problems than solutions when you try to interpret your own thing. Um, you can run yourself through feedback loops that you don't want to. Um, that podcast with Mark, I, I broke his blood work down for like a couple hours. So mm -hmm. I think it would actually be fun for you and I to reconnect sometime mm -hmm. and no. just totally unpack something. Yeah, we'll do. I'll get new blood work done the next time that we'll do that route. That'd be Cause awesome. Because then you'll have that and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we were just talking a little bit off air and I saw that he has all kind of DHEA present. So that mm -hmm. was after our conversation. Yep. <laughs> My man's on top of it. <laughs> that I love to hear. That's a, that's a major like anti-aging hormone in many ways. I've done a whole um, research review actually on that. Um, so that's one that you actually do want optimized in a big way um, for, for many reasons that I could continue to discuss. Quite confident I could do an entire seminar on the cortisol to DHEA ratio. But um, just having a quick look here on some things that I thought people would find interesting here. Um, I do see homocysteine is at 16.4. Um, homocysteine at 16.4, um, that, that flags you for, for several things kind of all at once. So when I look at a metric like this, um, this is something that can create a very meaningful change in somebody's life without a whole lot of effort being put in. So when you look at homocysteine, at 9.47, remember, so Dave's at 16.4, and the reference range is going up to 14.5, okay? At 9.47, you are at an early risk for cardiovascular uh, outcomes. So that's at 9.47. So we have flagged a cardiovascular risk issue. At 10, on paper, you're considered to be in a hyper homocysteinemic state. So hyper, lots of, homocysteinemia homocysteine in the blood. So at 10, on paper, clinically, you are considered hyperhomocysteinemic. And at that point, it becomes a marker for two things, oxidative stress and hypertension. So at 10, we've already flagged for cardiovascular issues at 9.47. And now at 10, oxidative stress and hypertension. One of the hypertension risk factors is because of the oxidative stress creating damage to the vascular networks at that point, increasing risk for hypertension. And at 11.84, it has been connected to all-cause mortality risk. So we have already tripped off four things on our way to really the final trip, which is at 15. Mm -hmm. And this has actually been connected to incidents of dementia. So incidents of dementia and cognitive um, impairment over time after 15. What essentially happens is um, you have folate and B12. Folate and B12, when low, result in an elevated homocysteine because folate and B12 are what help methylate and clear homocysteine. So when we lack an optimal amount of folate and B12 in our body, then we are unable to methylate and clear homocysteine at a rate that our body wants, which elevates homocysteine over time and results in a cognitive risk. You can actually see the risk factors perfectly mirror each other. And this was unique to folate in the paper that I'm thinking of right now, to where those who had the greatest amount of folate had the lowest amount of homocysteine and therefore the lowest incidence of dementia after follow-up. But those who had the lowest folate had the highest homocysteine and the highest risk of dementia incidence after follow-up. So this is something that is very clear and very linearly seen in the literature. So at a 16.4, 
to recap, 9.47 cardiovascular risk, 10 oxidative stress and hypertension, 11.84 all cause risk, and then at 15, um, uh, risk of uh, incidence of dementia over time and cognitive decline. This is a huge indicator of a need for B6, B9, and B12. These things are very effective at lowering and aiding in the methylation process of getting homocysteine out of the body. There is also a supplement called TMG that will provide methyl donors to help clear this as well. This should ideally be between about 5.5 and 8.5 to mm -hmm. pull you out of all, even the earliest canary in the coal mine risk factors. So I would be bringing that all the way down. This is a very health-based conversation. But to pull this back into performance-based blood work, which is my real main specialization here, this representation of lower B vitamin status is also going to impact energy production in the body. There's a reason why B vitamins are in every single energy drink. <laughs> they facilitate ATP production in the initial process of just converting glucose into pyruvate. Um, and then when you're pr converting pyruvate into something uh, known as acetyl-CoA before it can enter the Krebs cycle, you need B1, B2, B3, B5, and lipoate. So like there are many B vitamin coenzymes required just to convert pyruvic acid into acetyl-CoA so it can enter the Krebs cycle. So like this is just one example of the many areas that B vitamins actually facilitate ATP production, which is a big reason why energy drinks and, and different companies throw in tons of B vitamins and stuff to help you feel better, to help you have more energy. So when we can see a very clean indication of lower micronutrient status here, um, we can downstream connect that to certain energy production or ATP pathway issues. And then um, ultimately, you can begin to connect that downstream to, to other processes as well. So for example, we have a, a process in our body known as erythropoiesis. Um, a lot of people know erythropoietin because that's the drug Lance Armstrong took to have more mm -hmm. red blood cells yeah. to win. Um, but erythropoiesis is the natural process at which we create red blood cells. That begins in the bone marrow. And there are many metabolic processes that your body goes through to convert an immature red blood cell into a mature red blood cell. But about halfway through, there's this thing called nuclear maturation. And this counterintuitive thing takes place because you would think if you didn't have enough raw materials to make something, that it would make it contract rather than expand. But the opposite happens. If you don't have enough folate and B12, then it can result in something known as macrocytic anemia. Macro, big acidic fluid volume. So if we don't have enough folate and B12 present for nuclear maturation of the red blood cell, we actually get an expansion of this red blood cell, okay? Now this is very relevant. So we're gonna have some red blood cells that are large due to a lack of current micronutrient intake in the body. I'm looking at this other thing here from you called RDW, okay? RDW stands for red blood cell distribution width. So if I took out your blood and I put the smallest red blood cell on this side and the largest red blood cell on this side, RDW is the measurement difference between those two, okay? That's what RDW is. You're currently at a 15.2 and you were previously at a 15.9. This is a large distribution width, which should be less than 13. If when you start getting over 13, you see other uh, clear linear correlations between C-reactive protein and erythrocyte sedimentation rate, or ESR. Both acute and chronic inflammatory markers go up with RDW. They both track up. Um, and a big reason because of this is because RDW is the difference in size of your current red blood cells. Your red blood cells have a turnover rate of 120 days. So you can imagine four months from now, you're going to have new red blood cells. This makes RDW a very good representation of your micronutrient intake and or quality uptake from your gut health, mm -hmm. okay? And the reason why is because if we have a very large difference in the size of our red blood cells that are dependent upon micronutrients in order to facilitate uniform red blood cells, well, then we had a variation in micronutrients, which created a variation in size of the red blood cells, which can be measured by RDW, which tells me about the quality of your micronutrients over the past four months. Mm -hmm. which in this case wasn't consistent enough that I'm seeing in your RDW that I'm also seeing in your homocysteine. And we know what to target. So that's going to allow me 
to improve your energy production, have you feeling better, have you have more uniform red blood cells, which is going to promote optimal health in many different risk factors that we've discussed, but also way better performance. And you can even like, you can continue, like when you understand physiology at another level, you can just begin to like tease these other things out too. Cause it's like, well, we call it burning fat, but what's the biochemical process of it? Beta oxidation, key emphasis on oxa. You require oxygen at the mitochondria in order to oxidize fat for energy. Well, damn, what brings oxygen to those mitochondria? Healthy red blood cells. So if I don't have healthy red blood cells that carry optimal oxygen, then I'm actually you begin to create these little tiny one percent constraints, one at a mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. And then you that just you can go on with those examples for so long. And, and with respect to oxygen delivery and uh, deliverability and uptake, beta oxidation of fat, energy production during training, keeping yourself out of mortality risk factors. And this is just two markers here. You're looking at these two markers. And I already know in a very quick way, some low hanging fruit mm -hmm. that you're going to be able to do without me even changing your diet. That's just something very quick that we could take action on that. Um, and I don't say this lightly, correcting homocysteine is life changing. Yeah. <clears throat> it's life changing. The lowering of that extends life. <laughs> and it, as a byproduct of that, you're going to be a better badass in the gym too. Yeah. Yeah. Or be a better badass in the gym, which... It's more important, right? Which is more important. Right. It's, okay. you, you know how I really feel about it. You know why I learned this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, why yeah. I learned that's, it. That's, that's where it goes. Yeah. It's the shell that matters the yeah, most. Yeah. Was there anything else that you saw <clears throat> real quick? Where we at on time? We we're still pretty good. Um, well, we can just talk a little bit about, say, RBC, hemoglobin, and hematocrit. Um, both of these, or all three of these, rather, they did come back elevated. Um, the more red blood cells doesn't mean too much to me because they're not uniform. They're, there's a lot of room of optimization to be had there. Um, so that's something that um, it doesn't matter much to me. But you're going to see those go up with um, testosterone use. Um, you'll also see those go up with dehydration. So a good, a good little tool for people to look at would be, um, I remember you had your blood urea nitrogen somewhere. I guess I could just talk about it. Um, but I believe that you had, dang it. Um, well, regardless, I'll, I'll just talk about it. You had um, normal blood urea nitrogen and you had normal creatinine, okay? Those are acute dehydration markers. So hematocrit and hemoglobin are actually very well-validated dehydration markers. If you had elevated blood urea nitrogen and creatinine, then I would have known that you were dehydrated and that these weren't just elevated because of testosterone. Mm -hmm. But the fact that these are elevated and the blood urea nitrogen and creatinine aren't, we know that this is a testosterone derivative and that's what's going to happen. Testosterone actually upregulates erythropoiesis. That's, that's why red blood cells go up. And that's why when you have more red blood cells, you're going to have more iron. So you're going to have more hemoglobin. That makes sense. So those yeah. things are just simply going to track up with testosterone use. Another important thing that I could provide value here with is um, you would also see in a state of chronic dehydration, albumin go up. Well, there, there's a caveat that I'm going to throw out at you with that hemoglobin when I don't know what my testosterone was there. It's, it's over a grand, I think, mm -hmm. but it's <clears throat> when my testosterone's been 300 you know, or lower, that's higher. When my testosterone is higher, that's lower. And this has been the case for the past six years. But is it always still out of range? No. Now it went close, right? Close. So I'm just, just, you know, just barely in range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, with that. So to your point, almost elevated. Yeah. Right, yeah. but not way down. Okay, yeah. So it, it's, it's, it's a fucked up inverse relationship to where with <clears throat> some doctors I've met with that, you know, are 100% no testosterone. Yeah. Get rid of all of it. Yeah. Then I can show we're, them. We're not, we're not doing that. Yeah. Well, then I can show them, <laughs> yeah. right? And say, well, look, if what you're saying is true, I guess I need more. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. now if it was 4,000, <laughs> yeah. would it go down more? Yeah. Which is just me fucking around. Yeah, yeah, of course. Right? But it is, it's, a, it's an interesting one that pops up yeah. where there's been nobody that's been able to really point a figure as to why. Yeah. Right. But my testosterone moves around a lot. 
you know, even with steady dose and I'm not blasting shit and stuff like that, it still moves right more than what others will. Okay. So first thing that you could say to your doctor is, um, testosterone is a substance that we naturally make. So when you inject more of it, you're just more natural. Oh yeah. I'm, that's, yeah. that's what it that's is. That's just a gift. You're just even more natural yeah, of at that point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. one interesting thing with iron, um, did you, do you have elevated ferritin? I did it one time. You did? Yes. So that's interesting. Do you have gastrointestinal symptoms? Like, do you, then I probably that did. you'd be comfortable talking about? Well, then I probably did. I mean, that was probably almost two years. Have you ago. ever had a, a stool test done? No. So that's interesting, yeah. right? So it's it's been it's it, this is very well demonstrated. It's see, that your body has a host defensive, uh, uh, seen as a host defense mechanism, to actually store iron in the presence of an infection. Okay. So it's been said that uh, chocolate, or sorry, um, iron is like chocolate to bacteria because bacteria love iron. Bacteria use iron to multiply. It, it is a growth factor for them. So you, bacteria will seek out iron to utilize it to overgrow and become a potential pathogen. So as a host protective mechanism, your body will store iron and therefore things like hemoglobin and ferritin. And to go up as a as a protective mechanism from away from the current infectious state. And then why I'm saying that is because I'm looking at your neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio right now. You're at 71 to 15 on a ratio. Okay, so just so the audience is tracking me here, um, you have your total white blood cell count, which is 6.5, which is a normal white blood cell count. However, there is a there is a percentage distribution of your white blood cells. White blood cells are a family. But then you, when you look at a lab, you look, you scroll down a little bit, you'll see neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. When you add those up, it'll equal 100 because it is a percentage distribution of what your body is making. So we have our total white blood cells and then these five different white blood cells. And how your body is making them lets us know what your body thinks is currently important. Kind of goes back to, mm -hmm. huh, I wonder why the body thought that was a good idea. Yeah. Because right now your white blood cells are normal. However, you should have a two to one ratio between neutrophils and lymphocytes. If you exceed a two to one ratio of neutrophils and lymphocytes, it is representative of an infectious state somewhere in the body. You're at 71 to 15. This is way higher than even three to one. Mm -hmm. This is very representative of uh, acute or chronic bacterial infection at this point in time. So then when I see neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio that skewed into the direction of a potential infection, somebody who's talked about gastrointestinal symptoms, somebody who has unexplainable stored iron, and somebody who's <laughs> never done a stool test, yeah, <laughs> I, I go well, Dave. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna start you on curcumin, quercetin, and green tea because all of those reduce iron uptake from food. So we can start quercetin, uh, curcumin, and green tea to reduce iron uptake from food. So we can at least stop taking in as much of this heavy metal or uptaking it mm -hmm. rather from the red meat that we have to eat because we're meatheads. So we're just gonna add that in to reduce iron absorption until the results of your stool test come in when I'm going to find that you have a bacterial overgrowth <laughs> and then we're going to get rid of that together. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's, yeah. that's really how this would play out. And this is really just, you know, we're looking at one page here. Yeah. And then you can, this would, yeah, I'm building your program. Yeah. This is how this works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, <clears throat> with, and there's a lot of labs there. So when you have that much, to go back to what I asked earlier, when you build that out, how do you prioritize that? I mean, the low hanging fruit, obviously that's, that's easy, but then how do you prioritize the other one? So it's not a million things changing at one time. Yeah. So you don't know exactly what's working, what's not working. Yeah. How, how I typically set it up is I'll have someone on what I call a foundation and I, I run programs in 20 week waves. So I'll typically have them have a foundation. So this is the, this is your foundation supplementation routine that you're going to run for 20 weeks. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I have phasic importances. So weeks five to eight, first thing, weeks nine to 12, next thing, 13 to 15, next thing. And then after that, from week 16 to 20, you're just back on the clean foundation again. Yeah. So that's really how I build that out. And it's based upon um, perceived importance, like something uh, from a foundational perspective, I can put you on the B vitamins in order to lower your homocysteine right away. That's something yeah, you can take yeah. for 20 weeks. And mm -hmm. that's not going to be a foundational issue. Like uh, there, this is something that we can implement right away while we build your, your body up and handle some quick fires very quickly. 
before moving into your first phase, your second phase, and your third. And it's no physiology is the same. So there's not a very clean answer to that because it's going to be based upon whatever was the highest priority thing that was in your labs. And then it's going to be the next priority and then yeah. it's going to be the next priority. Right. So that's how it works. That brings me to two questions for you as we kind of wrap this thing up is <clears throat> how does one, one is contact re related, the other is kind of business related. Mm -hmm. How does somebody get a hold of you to work with you? Mm -hmm. First question. And then B, how do you, as a business, how do you scale? Because there's only one of you. Yeah. So does... This is a beautiful underhanded pitch, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I couldn't have wrote that down better. Um, so there's two options. <laughs> I uh, First is the rapidhealthreport.com. You go to Rapid Health Report, and that is where you get to work with me and get the true pro athlete experience. So I turn you into a science experiment. Um, everything from the outside in, everything from the inside out gets measured, managed, and has a protocol designed for it, you undergo a true optimization system um, that is not scalable. I, we can only take in 100 people per year, and that's it. That it, it can't go more because I cannot service more people than that. It's 100 per year, ro rolling about two per week max, mm -hmm. and uh, that's a wrap. So that program always has a waiting list, always. So if somebody, if anybody's interested in that, you have to go to rapidhealthreport.com and um, join the waiting list for it. And that is, that's the most comprehensive coaching program in the world. That is not scalable. It is 100 people per year, done. But you will get blood, urine, saliva, stool done and have an entire team of specialists behind you to make sure that you become the next version of yourself every single time. My scalable option is um, it's currently not out at the time of this release of this podcast, but it will be launched in January. So what I've done is I've started a company called Vitality, and Vitality is a blood work interpretation software. So what I've done, an extreme amount of work and effort has gone into converting my brain into an algorithm. By data scientists and interviewers and every and myself creating coding logic every single day, um, I I have put my heart and soul into creating a scalable version of Rapid, um, that which is that advanced coaching program. So that is a blood work interpretation software that I will be launching in January. And how it'll essentially work is um, you will be able to go to my website. You will order my preferred panel, which is a human performance panel. This is, I am not in the market of like longevity and stuff like that. No, I'm a performance guy. Yeah. So you are coming to my software to perform better, period. So you will order my human performance panel. The panel will be sent to you. You'll get your blood work done. You won't even have to do anything because the blood work is automatically uploaded into my software. The software will automatically generate reports for lifestyle, nutrition, training, and supplementation to an extreme degree of accuracy, and you will be built a phasic program like we talked about here today. Mm -hmm. So that is the scalable and highly affordable version of what I do. Rapid is the extreme version of um, that is very pro athlete and CEO based or people who just really want to go all in on it. So those are the two options that I currently have. RapidHealthReport.com for the comprehensive coaching process. It will be Vitality Blueprint dot com for my blood work interpretation software you can go there to sign up for the email list so that you know when that thing is launched and ready to go and lastly if you just want to learn from me uh, myself and dr andy galpin who's a brilliant mind um, him and i started biomolecular athlete which is an education company where we just um, teach people the protocols and strategies we use with pro athletes in both training and nutrition and that's at biomolecularathlete.com all right. I want to thank you for coming out. We'll definitely have you come back out again after I get all the panels, and that will be like a 12 hour podcast. Hell yeah, dude. <laughs> we're just going to go that route. I will just take Modafinil. Yeah. We'll be fine. No, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're good there. Yeah. We're good there. No problem with that. Um, any final thoughts? <clears throat> um, no. Um, thank you so much for having me, man. I've been following you forever. So being here and actually being in this room and talking to you is a lot cooler for me than I've probably let on. Um, I'm serious. I'm very grateful. Thank you for having me. Um, if anybody liked my ramblings, you can follow me at Dan Garner Nutrition on Instagram. Okay. Thank you for coming out. We'll have all the links in the description and we're done.